Good evening and welcome to the Deerfield Select Board Board of Health meeting, January 23rd, 2019 at 610 here in the municipal offices in the town of South Deerfield. Uh, we'd like to start our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you all please rise? I pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. This meeting is being recorded. So, do you want to start by doing approving the minutes? Just get yes. that out of the way. Um, I make a motion we approve the minutes of December 12th. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. That's good. So, the FERCOG DLTA project. When we went to Trevor Getz here, he's discussed he that. that. Okay. Yeah. I guess the only question I had on that, Wendy, was I just wanted to make sure um, our hazardous mitigation plan, we were signed yeah, up for that. It's separate from that. We're okay. all set with that. We okay. don't need to check that off. Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah. And all then right. we'll go through the whole thing when he gets here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have an appointment of Melissa Hale to the Town Commons Committee. I appoint, uh, I mean, I make a motion to appoint Melissa Hale to the Town Commons Committee. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? Only that I want to say thank you for her time. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Here's a, a one day liquor license for Deerfield Academy for February 19th. I make a motion to approve that. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? No. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We can uh, stamp those. Okay. Um, do we have to have, we should uh, probably not say just one day. It's the effect of the 18th through the 20th because it's the day before and the day after. So you have set up the actual event and then the cleanup. Um. So. I, I guess I'll change my motion to include um, a, the f a date of the 18th of February to the 20th of February. I'll second that motion. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. How do you deal with the, the actual permit? Just it just one, says one day. It just says one day, but yeah. I remember that was a, a key initiative when she was here that we get the three days to allow them to okay. Yeah, the so that there's no, there's no um, issues. Okay. Which is fine. Right. But that means we have to um, approve the three day time frame. Okay. Do we miss um, the uh, auto, East Deerfield auto wrecking? No, that's next. Okay. No, I meant. Uh, oh, okay. It's, yeah, we just got it. Oh, you just got it. Okay. Right. I think they return their information okay. later. So there's a. Um, I make the motion to approve it. Okay, that's a class three dealer's license for the East Deerfield Auto Rec. Mm -hmm. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Uh, do you want to wait for Trevor to set the um, bond amount? For the conditions on the mass RE12 solar project? Probably makes sense. I think there's going to be some discussion about that. So. The 20 FY20 budget classification uh, compensation plan, we're going to pass on that again? Yes, I'm, I just want to okay. go through the budget season. Just an update we were at the Finance Committee meeting last night. They pretty much went through what you went through at your last meeting. So. Okay. So, you're, to be clear, are you are you tabling that? Do you want that to continue to be on the agenda each week, or are you tabling it to a future time? I'd, I'd like to see the. I mean, I'm not ready to vote on it until we go through the bud, more of the budget process. I'm so, just curious as to how um, how you you expect the, without that number, are you just going to want the different uh, department heads. To to inflate their payroll until we make a decision? 
No, I think all three of us agree on the step. Right. But there is no agreement on the, the COLA. Right, but. So that we can, you can calculate the step into the payroll. But, but that COLA would also increase the payroll, so I. Yeah, but Kev, it's like $16,000 at the end of the year. But okay. I want to make sure when we, we go through this, what, what, I, I want to look at the budget and I want to see what our budgets look like. Okay. Before I'm, I make a commitment. All right. So what I hear you saying is should we proceed with distributing the budgets with the salary numbers with just including the step yep. and no additional increase at this time? At because this time. because we've been holding off or Brenda's been holding off and distributing those budget sheets without, the right. without that information. But I think we need to proceed with doing that. So is that what I understand you to be saying? I, 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 I'm, it seemed like all three of us agreed with the personnel board um, right. recommendation of a step. Right. But Trevor, Trevor also wanted to do the, the 2%, um, or at least I feel that was his position. Mm -hmm. um, he made that motion at our last, at our last meeting. Um, so, you know, and, and my only concern is that, you know, you're, you're basically asking them to, I don't know, to, to inflate it because it's going to change. And if, Kip, if the $16,000. We have never in my 16 years, this is the first year that we had to make a decision in the front of the budget process. We've always okay. waited till the end of the budget process. So, All right, so I, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm old. I don't want to change it. I like the idea of waiting till the end of the budget process before we, so we, we wait have a the end of the budget. I'm just, I just want to understand this. So at the end of the budget process, if we vote for both, then we're going to have to change the budget. Well, that's what you're saying. But that's usually what happens. Yes. Okay. Yes, I think that's what okay. we would do. Well, and you just right. adjust so the, we, just we just the we payroll. We can't have the dialogue right. until we have the budget. So exactly. we have to move so forward. So yes. why don't we not put it on the budget on the, on the agenda. agenda for all probably till. I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I want to see. We'll continue yeah. with the budget process, and we'll okay. put it back I, on. I would, March. I would say, it would, March is probably the okay. right okay. time frame. It's just, I want to get okay. a handle on the Thank budget. You. We've Thank just you. barely started. But we okay. may have other Thank budgets, non-salary budgets, for you to review. Right. 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 Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so, do you want to open the special town meeting, Warren? Um, we could do that, I guess. Uh, we're looking at September, I'm uh, sorry, um, February 25th for a special town meeting. Yeah, I, um, this I'm. This opens it, allows it for people to bring petitions if they want it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with February 25th. Okay. All right. Want to vote to open it? I make a motion to open it. I'll second that motion. Any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. Aye. Is, did I see somewhere that's going to be at the high school? No. Oh, it's going to be here? Um, yeah, we usually have special town meetings here. Right. right. You, I know. You'll, you, need, you need a quorum of 35 for your specials. Maybe it's I'm not just, really. Well, yeah, I was just wondering. I mean, if you think you need more room, then. Uh, we barely get 40 people. Right. Well, it's a little different. Well, okay. This is going to be a, right. You might well, want to have well, some You need to discuss that yeah. and figure that uh, out. Primarily, yeah, the special meeting is, is a going big to be turnout. the. Yeah. Uh, to consider uh, funding the repairs to the South Deerfield sewage treatment plant. Um, I don't know how many people are, are going to be that interested in it, uh, but the overall picture is we're looking at uh, about a $28 million improvement to the plant, uh, to both plants. Um, and part of that, the funding mechanism is that the user fees will pay for 75% of it, but everybody in town, even the septic, you, sep people on septic systems are going to be paying 25% of it, or other general uh, funds will pay for the 25% uh, of it. So it might attract more people who are interested in it. I, we don't have much of a choice. Uh, we're kind of under an order from DEP to make the uh, repairs to the final clarifier at the South Deerfield plant. It broke last winter, and um, it needs to get fixed. So, but I believe that, that and that's a million dollars. That's a million dollars right around there. Okay. Um, so that's a special town meeting. 
still early. Really nice We're going to wait for that. Wendy, do you want to give us? Yeah, why don't you give us an update uh, and report you out? Okay, so um, uh, we had a, one of the two likely candidates for the building commissioner position withdraw to continue in their own job, the benefits they have there. So we we have re-advertised the position, um, and I spoke to the other person who's still interested in being considered. So we got one person, but we advertising it again but for two okay. weeks due in two weeks so um, uh, let's see what else um, I'm hoping this, if not this week early next week to post the transfer station attendant position oh good and let's see um, I was on the conference call with the state education DESE -E 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 today announcing the governor's proposal for education funding, which is they took the four major recommendations of the commission. Um, they primarily advantage the very needy urban communities. Um, they kind of walked through that for the first 40 minutes and then, um, or 20 minutes, and then at the end talked about rural funding, um, level funding, um, transportation. I, Sad to hear that. Um, the need is so great, as we know here, for the for funding there. Um, Excuse me. Is, are you talking new business or old I'm talking town administrator's report. Is that not on? I'm sorry? Uh, you, you're right. Yeah, we were meeting. just waiting yeah. for Trevor. Here he Who is. just came? Thanks. There will be more information coming out. Right before the meeting, I got emails about all this and sent it to, to your, you and the Finance Committee with the budget, budget um, the um, local aid for the schools and the town projected in House 1, which is the, bu the governor's budget. So you'll see that in your email. Um, I'll stop now. because I Okay. Can we can back go back up. Things. We have a few minutes. So we can go back up to the um, DLTA. Do you, uh, do you want to... Uh, fill out the comment uh, for Deerfield Naturals from the Planning Board and the Mass Ari. Uh, oh, yeah, uh, then they can. But I don't think that's necessary. We approve that this evening. So. Okay. Um, do we have to f do the bond, set the bond? Yep. Um, my only question was wh how reliable is the, um, I mean, every all these solar projects are running through, so there's going to be like this huge aging out of all the projects at the same time. How, how, how do we have any idea what the recycling costs know. of the, these the panels folks are? From, um, from the Mass RE 12 here, do, would you like to come up and just speak to that topic, just the, the decommissioning of? Yes, I can, um, I can speak a little bit. This, um, I apologize. This was prepared by our um, contractor who has provided the bond statement for us. Um, this was based off of what we've done with other towns and based off the size of the project. Um, Turn the mic on, John. Yeah, sometimes you just got to get really close. Yeah. To Sorry it. about that. That's okay. um, so I apologize. What was your question? I want to make sure. Well, I, I was wondering, all these projects are about the same age. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a ton of projects going in to meet this deadline. So all these um, projects are going to be aging at the same rate, and then everyone's going to have these uh, an huge, huge number of panels across the state that would have to be recycled at the same time or decommissioned at the same time or whatever. Um, how, ha, I mean, w how are we supposed to, 20 years from now, have a, a correct estimate of what it's going to cost? Nope. Gotcha. So, um, so I, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, the big thing with, um, it's kind of hard to estimate, I don't want to say it's hard to estimate these, but it's actually the scrap value of the project itself ends up being a good portion of including those decommissioning costs um, because actually the racking system is made of steel. You can recycle the steel. Um, the solar panels, there's a secondary market as well. Um, and so that's why that's where a lot of these scrap value costs comes from is because um, actually the decommissioning of the project itself really actually ends up paying, I'm sorry, recycling the, the product actually ends up paying for the labor to actually take apart the decommission the project. Um, I apologize. I wish I could speak more on it. My contractor, I'm more than happy to have him provide more information as well. 
Um, I think the, the, the problem that we have is setting a, a dollar amount on that. Mm -hmm. um, did you come with any recommendations? I mean, we can listen to them. At the uh, there's, yeah, I, the I know we provided a, um, a handout as well, too. Down. And this was, oh, I apologize. Um, and this was prepared by our contractor as well, um, Industria, who has done multiple solar projects throughout uh, Massachusetts. Like I said, we've done a couple as well too, and this is where we prepared. Um, they prepared these numbers based on our project as well. And the very on page five, if you look at the handout, yep. Um, this is where he's prepared some numbers as well for labor costs, um, actually restoring, loaning, and seeding the property itself, um, getting the equipment to the site to decommission, and then actually the scrap value cost as well. In today's values and also 2039. Yes, yes, yep. yes. And it's projected as, yeah, 20 years because that's um, the um, typical life of the solar projects, 20 years. And then, um, so my understanding, there would be a bond, kind of this money would be set aside, this amount of money would be set aside each year until you get to that. Yes, point. yes, so, yes. Okay. So, we were, so we were proposing to put um, $2,500 a year into an escrow account to fund to get to that amount for um, 2039 costs. I'm not sure I agree with this. Um, I mean, I don't really have a mm -hmm. basis to say that you're wrong, but it just seems like it's not, um, it just doesn't seem like enough money. I, I just can't imagine that would cover labor costs, that's all. Ava. I was gonna say. I was, uh, no, sorry, the labor's only 36. No, you want to talk some more on that? This is a Public comment on yeah, so, if you want to. Well, you had a question. Did you have a question or did you have a comment? It's a comment. If you have okay, a you need to come up. So that everyone can hear your comment, Ava. <laughs> oh, yeah. My name is Ava Gipps, 617 River Road. So, um, if you listen to the previous meeting of the planning board, I was totally for this. Um, solar development on River Road because it's a great use of this land, you know. However, when I look, um, I asked Matt, I actually thought about the, deed. now I, I really don't know anything about this, but one thing I do know is I think that 1.5 inflation rate is way too low. That's my comment, way too low. I can't, I mean, I'm 70 years old. I've seen a much higher inflation rate and if we want to, so I'm very interested in this thing, but I'm also very interested that the town not be stuck with costs at the end of this. See, I don't know how this works. I don't know if the cost, if they put too much in, do we give it back to them? I don't really understand, but I think we should protect ourselves and ask for a higher inflation cost. It's not 1.5, it's two, and God help us, it even could be 3% in the next 20 years, given everything. So I don't, I can't, there's no other comments I could give. I have no idea what his contractor, you know, his contractor gave him these costs. But I do know that we're gonna have more than 1.5 inflation rate. We probably do now, the government takes away some very, if you look at what is based inflation rate, it's nonsense, because some things are not put into that that should be into it. That's one comment. The other one is it doesn't say on the, on, do I talk about conditions now or not? Yeah. Or just the money? Just, uh, probably just the just money, money yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. then that's, I've said it. Yeah. I, I think, I don't know if this will help clarify it all. I, I mean, and I agree with Ava that, you know, one and a half percent inflation seems a, a bit low. But, but on the other hand, I think if you look at the big picture here, this project is being put on private land and what we're asking for is um, some insurance that the town doesn't get stuck with a bill. But there's a lot of moving parts to this. First of all, there's a big assumption that 20 years from now, these people are all gonna disappear. And let's say they do. Um, then the landowner is still liable for cleaning it up if, if he chooses to, or he could just leave it there. Uh, if the town came along and said, look, we don't wanna look at this abandoned solar field. It doesn't make electricity anymore. It's an eyesore you know, the town would then have to go through a court per proceeding to get permission to go in there to clean it up. Uh, we'd have to prove that it's some sort of a, a hazard to, you know, people's lives and stuff like that, like an abandoned house. I mean, we have a very small community, but there are homes in our community that have been 
neglected for many years and you know they're they're rodent infested and, and, and we have a very difficult time getting to, to clean this up so when I look at whatever money these people put aside even though I agree that the inflation rate is low I think that it, it's, it's a at least a positive step you know um, and then and then if these people put this money aside at the end of 20 years and they say well it's still an operational facility and they choose they get their money back then the town doesn't have any money anyway so if somebody abandons this thing after a certain amount of time you know the town's still left in the same position it isn't like the town gets this money at the end anyways it's only if we're forced to clean it up and i think and i think the legal fees would probably be more than this alone just trying to get to do that but so i don't really know what the bottom line is so um um, would it be a deal breaker to make this a little bit much, a little bit more money? Yeah, I mean, what is, um, I guess, what is uh, a rate that would be um, proposed? I'm just going to say come up to the mic. Yeah, oh, yeah, come well, up to the mic. I'm sorry. I apologize. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, what would be, I guess, a rate that would be proposed? I mean, I know Ava mentioned 2%. I believe, don't I believe that 2017, the inflation rate was 2%. I'm not, I believe so. I mean, I would, um, but I would feel at least a little bit more comfortable with 2%. That would... That would be fine. Like I said, we, this is just what we've proposed in the past with towns. It's kind of what we were basing it off of. But, I mean, like I said, we want the town to feel comfortable as well, too. Yeah. As long with, you know, Ava, she's been supportive of the project, too. And it's, yeah. I mean, this is, this would be fine. So I, I, I guess I would feel more comfortable with two. No, and if it's not a deal breaker, because I understand the neighborhood does support this, mm -hmm. and I support the neighborhood in this, no. but, and it is a best use for a brownfield. But I, um, you know, I just, this, I think this is an issue that's going to come back and haunt the town. And it, it won't be my problem, but it will be somebody's problem. And I, I feel like we should make be a little bit more proactive. So if you don't two mind 2%, mm -hmm. yes. I would feel more comfortable. No, that's perfectly fine. I guess we want to make sure everyone's comfortable as well, too. Okay. So that Thanks. would be fine. That, that, uh, that raises a bigger question. Uh, is at the end of the 20-year lease, I mean, are we requiring, and I haven't seen any of this in the planning board, are we requiring that they take this apart? No. 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 They, could, so they could then reinstitute they could, they or put new panels exactly. on. Exactly. So, all kinds of I mean, what happens to this money at the end of 20 years? They just get it back. Well, yeah. I mean, that's... Escrow. that's held in escrow. I mean, I think it's held in escrow, yeah. and it would be... It, yeah. yeah. Whoever we can roll it over. For, it would, whoever is here would roll it over for, for another you know, one. another... Right. Okay. One of the things I was just... Suggesting to Diana, we could talk to with um, Beth Greenblatt, who we're working with on the yeah. landfill solar. She's worked with everybody, and she knows that. Yeah. Kind of well, I don't want to make it not attractive right, right. and not competitive. Of what course. did you but do with the other River Road project? I know it wasn't on. Uh, it's on private, very much on private land, but. I don't know. I don't remember seeing a dollar amount at all. So we could. We recommend had a, the two percent, and then maybe a clause in the end that it could be negotiated after twenty years if they de yeah. decide yeah. to decommission or move yeah. forward. We'll, we'll yeah. address it in twenty years. Yeah, I, I just okay. if that's okay. <laughs> All right, thank, thank you. you. Uh, excuse me, but what is you know, the, can you what come is up the to the microphone, microphone please? Introduce, please. What is the twenty-year? Oh, <laughs> no, the, the people at it's for television. <laughs> they all want to hear your nice you voice. Screen but. time for you, but you gotta. Do what every I get yelled at if people don't come up. What is the amount of money in twenty years that we're talking about? What's the volume around of money? forty-seven thousand dollars? How much? Forty-seven thousand. And that's going to cover the cost of re reclamation of the solar panel material, the the, the fluid. No, those, no fluid. No, in. There's no not. fluid. Okay. But it, I, I was worried about labor costs. Not, it not being realistic no with labor. Thanks, guys. Thank you, but. All right. Okay. okay. Um, so what did you decide? Well, I made a motion. I'll make a motion to uh, have the the bond adjusted to a two percent inflation. The and dollar amount you're adequate with. Yes. Like, okay. Whatever. Yes. Yeah. Okay. What two percent? And and then. Um, and then a, a clause. I'm not sure if there's in here, but just to just to re have it, both parties reconsider in 20 years, or if you decide to move okay. on or reinvest or whatever. I mean, technology in 20 years might be, you know, you might get a whole bunch more out of that field than you will with the panels you have now. Yeah. So. 
I'll second that. Okay. okay. Any further discussion? No. no. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. So. Thank you so much. And so then you are. The dollar amount is thirty-four thousand nine ninety-two with a, a, a rate of two percent, an escalation of two percent annually. Okay. And then you are making this recommendation to include this as a condition to the permit granting authority. Sure. Is yes. Correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Yes. Yes, it's 6.30. Um, They're here. Okay, here. The, the folks from the UMass River Road uh, Ag Fields. May we join you at the table? Please. Yes, yes. please. Thank you. Thank you. We have a few of us here. I guess we'll Great. Three at a time, though. <laughs> we Thank you. Chairs. <laughs> Michelle and James. Welcome. Thank, Thank you, you for, Thank you for coming. coming. You're welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Um, we're looking forward to sharing some information with you tonight and hopefully addressing some of the concerns. Great. Um, my name is Joe Schoenfeld. I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Agriculture, Food, and the Environment at the University, which is the entity that manages this facility as well as several other research farms in the Valley. Um, I think we'll start by introducing ourselves and then I'll come Thank back you. and say a few words and then pass it along. Great. Hi, um, good evening. Uh, my name is Michelle DaCosta. I am an associate professor within the Stockbridge School of Agriculture at UMass. Thank you. Uh, my name is James Poro. I am the superintendent of the Turf Research Facility on River Road. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. You guys want to? Oh, sure. uh, oh, well, you could come up. Yes, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Tony Marulis, executive director of external relations and university events. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, Bob Scalbot, I'm the farm manager for the Center for Ag at UMass. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks guys. Um, we're very proud of this facility and the work being done there in research, in teaching, and in uh, outreach education for turf professionals in the state. Um, just to be clear about what we do there, the university's turf management program, as well as this research center, are focused on the professional management of turf, such as uh, public grounds, parks, playing fields, golf courses. What we're not focused on is home lawn care or turf farms which sell turf, which, uh, sell turf for removal. The Turf Research Center is named after the late Joseph Troll, who taught at UMass Amherst for 28 years and nationally was considered a pioneer in developing modern turf grass management methods. Um, the center sits on 18 acres of land. It's managed by Superintendent Poro over there, um, with oversight from farm manager Bob Scalbite back here, both of whom work for my unit, the Center for Agriculture, Food, and the Environment. There are a handful of faculty members, and Dr. DaCosta is one of them, who conduct research there and utilize the facility with their students. Uh, the facility is also used to educate professional turf managers from around the state at demonstrations, field days, and things like that. The orientation of the research is toward two things. One, importantly, developing or refining techniques that will enable turf managers to protect the environment in their communities while maintaining turf that meets the needs of their facilities. Two, helping turf managers do their jobs effectively and maintain the quality of the workforce, the turf workforce in their towns and businesses. You're going to hear a little more about the research and the industry in a few minutes from Dr. DaCosta. Um, we do understand that the invitation to visit with you today stems from concerns about the impacts of the management practices of the research center. And we're, we are committed to running a very professionally managed operation, one that is concerned with the health of the environment, of the people in the neighborhood, and the people in the research center itself. You'll hear from Superintendent Poro about the protocols and practices in place on the site to assure that. James, by the way, holds a master's degree from the UMass Turf Management Program and has, has held the position there for since 2012 or 13, something yeah, like that. 2014. Um, we do understand that the unknown can be concerning. And we want to try to provide information that will reassure you about our practices and we also want to take additional steps in the future to welcome our neighbors to the facility to see how we operate, 
the nature of the research and the people who work there. So we appreciate the opportunity today to pro provide you with some hopefully comprehensive information about the facility. Great. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. DaCosta. Hi. Hi. Thank you for, ha for having us here today. And it's, this is my first time in front of one of these boards. So it's very exciting. <laughs> um, but so I am an associate professor at the university. So I've been with the university since 2006. This is when I joined the faculty there. Um, my, I have a bachelor's in science to, of, of science degree in biology and a PhD in plant biology. And um, what brought me here was uh, the, well, what we were the plant, soil, and insect sciences program, but now the Stockbridge School of Agriculture. Um, the program here has, uh, is known throughout the United States, especially for its uh, turf grass science program, but I myself am a plant physiologist, and so and I study how plants respond to different stresses. And so coming here in 2006, a lot of my research started right then at the Troll Turf Research Facility. Um, we have five other faculty members who are also active in their in research there, which cover many different disciplines. Um, and so what I just wanted to uh, come and talk a little bit about today was some of the research that, that we do there. Um, as Joe mentioned, we have a, a very strong commitment to, um, in general, environmental sustainability in turf grass, in turf grass management. Um, in New England itself, the turf grass industry is over $11 billion in economic impact. Um, and so it's an important commodity uh, and stakeholder group for for the university, uh, in addition to the fruit growers and the vegetable growers, et cetera. Um, and so a lot of what we do at the facility is centered on kind of three major sustainability and best management practices. I myself do uh, most of my research is actually in water conservation. Um, but we also have folks who are um, pest management specialists. They, have, they hold their degrees in pest management, so they work on um, reducing use of pesticides in particular uh, for environmental purposes. And, um, and then, and just and lastly, is just best, um, just looking at cultural practices, which to us means identifying the top grasses that we can use um, for sports grasses, home lawns to some extent as well, and for golf courses. And so at our facility currently, we're one of the, um, I think, well, there's about 10 facilities in the U.S., 10 universities in the U.S. that hold um, turf grass evaluation trials. We have over 1,200 plots that are just looking at different varieties of grasses. Um, and I know many of you may not look at grasses and see that there's differences, but to us, we're trying to identify the top grasses that use little to no water and reduce pesticides. And so we have one of the best facilities in the U.S. for that. Um, if you ever drive by River Road and you see these <coughs> greenhouse structures or these greenhouses moving automatically when it starts to rain, that's a lot of my research. And we, uh, again, are one of the only facilities in New England that has these types of, uh, or this type of research. And what we're trying to do is identify grasses that you don't have to irrigate as much. And so um, another one of our faculty members, his work is trying to look at different grasses for different playing surfaces. Uh, many of you who might follow the whole debate about natural grass versus synthetic turf mm -hmm. and some of the differences between that. We don't do research on synthetic turf, but we're looking at the attributes of many different grass species to try to increase um, the quality of the surfaces, but also to increase player, sa uh, player safety. So, um, and we're also looking at uh, some of the other faculty members are looking at different uh, novel <coughs> technologies to be able to use less water, and particularly nutrients. One of our faculty members is um, well recognized around the country for his work on um, enhancing nutrient use efficiency in grasses. Um, and so we're, we enjoy what we do out there, and we really try to, um, to in, we interact quite a bit with the industry. And so we have not just the students, but a lot of stakeholder groups coming in. Um, and because of that, we're, we're known throughout the United States for our, for our program. So right. if there's anything else, I'll be happy to answer about our research. Thank you. Thank you.
James. Um, <clears throat> my name's James. This also is my first town meeting as well. <laughs> um, I, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but thanks again for uh, providing us the opportunity here to speak with you. Um, I just want to hopefully shed a little bit of light on perhaps what might have brought this about in terms of uh, much, much more uh, visual uh, uh, awareness of some of the protective equipment that I've been wearing more recently. Uh, before I get started, though, I do want to mention I do have the uh, safety data sheets um, as requested from this past season. Uh, and I do want to point out that with these uh, safety data sheets, um, <clears throat> in terms of the required uh, personal protective equipment, or PPE, uh, typically what I have been seen uh, wearing this past season uh, generally usually exceeds what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for example, on most of the pesticides that we use at the facility, uh, what I'm wearing currently would suffice for the most part, added in some uh, chemical resistant gloves and occasional uh, eye protection uh, would suffice for the use of those pesticides. So when I choose to uh, wear a chemical suit, uh, which does unfortunately is yellow, is the most comfortable one, and I understand that doesn't look good from a distance, <laughs> um, also a respirator or a face shield. Uh, those are actually my personal choice to go above and beyond uh, what is warranted or required by the label uh, in most cases. So, uh, And the reason that I've really started doing that recently this past season, which, you know, uh, and I do apologize to our neighbors that, you know, may have seen this kind of occur over the last, you know, eight months or so, and it may seem uh, concerning because we haven't done it in the past, is just uh, my attempt to do my job in a safer manner and do whatever I can to reduce uh, any sort of occupational hazard associated uh, with pesticide use. Uh, and to give you an example of that, um, so when I apply a pesticide for research purposes, uh, I have to make it into a sprayable formulation, say for example, that would be similar to something we might purchase off the shelf uh, at Home Depot. And to do that, I have to work with um, a highly concentrated uh, product or pesticide, whatever that may be. And because it is uh, concentrated, that inherently has a higher uh, hazard associated with it. So that process of creating a diluted uh, sprayable formulation also opens up uh, potential exposure opportunities to me working with that pesticide. Um, so, for example, you know, if there's splashing that might occur as I'm spilling, filling the sprayer, or if, for example, I might accidentally just brush up against the sprayer where there is uh, some residue or the container that that pesticide came in, um, those are opportunities where I am, you know, putting myself at risk uh, on the job uh, of being exposed to that concentrated material. And so I have, in an effort to try to do my job better, more efficiently, and safer, um, tried to really instill this past season, well, I'm going to go above and beyond uh, what the label requirement warrants and requires so that during that process, I've added an additional barrier to help protect myself uh, in those scenarios in case, for example, an accident or something should happen. Um, I do really want to point out during that mixing and loading process, uh, it poses no hazard to anyone else. Uh, that includes anyone at the facility or the general public. Um, certainly the only person that poses a hazard in that process is myself, who's in arm's length of mixing that product and everything. Uh, but likewise, when uh, the application of that particular product, uh, whatever we're using at the time, uh, when that occurs, uh, I try to take that uh, same diligence and, um, and safety-oriented attitude to make sure we are applying in a manner to prevent any sort of off-target movement uh, from what our goal is. And uh, certainly we have to take weather into consideration, uh, wind, rain, uh, weather direction, or wind direction is a major consideration. So just an example, if there's a, southern, a wind out of the south that's going towards our abutting neighbors, um, you know, that may very well determine whether or not I can make an application that day. Um, and also the equipment that we use uh, and uh, how it's used it plays a role into reducing the possibility of drift occurring. Um, so for example, our uh, spray, our boom sprayer that we use, the nozzles are located um, just uh, 16 to 18 inches off the ground, which is very low in comparison to a lot of other agricultural situations. Uh, combined with 
the use of low drift nozzles uh, in combination with low um, pressures uh, really promote the idea of a larger droplet size, which is important for also uh, trying to reduce the, the movement or possibility of drift occurring. Uh, and lastly, I also have to take into consideration every time I spray where on our property I am applying any kind of product. So we are very close to River Road. We, we, uh, some of our research plots are very adjacent to the road itself. So certainly if I'm making any applications that day um, and I do my best to be aware of any kind of activity happening along the road. So if I see someone, I immediately stop the application I'm making and out of an abundance of caution, give that person time to move on out of sight or at least uh, far enough away where the proximity is not a concern at which point I can resume any kind of uh, application I may be making at that day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, overall, I just uh, kind of hopefully shed a little bit of light on this, and I just want to reiterate the fact that, um, you know, recently, uh, you know, is maybe perhaps more visible of a lot of the PP, uh, PPE I'm wearing, and that's really in an effort to, uh, you know, allow me to do my job uh, more efficiently and safer and, um, and I've have instituted for myself that uh, regardless of what I am applying, so I may not actually be applying a pesticide, it may be a fertilizer, or I may just be cleaning the, uh, the sprayer, but if I'm going to be using it in any manner, I am going to wear the maximum amount of PPE that I can uh, just to make that second nature and essentially instinctual uh, to make my job safer on a daily basis. And uh, with that, if there's any questions that uh, I can answer, I will try my best. Thank you. Well, I guess I do have a few questions. I don't. Yeah, go ahead. Paul, oh. I will uh, mention also we do have a little bit more information coming from Bob Scalbite over there. You're welcome to ask your questions now or here. His okay. Contribution. Well, it's been at least um, a decade, and I admit since I've had my MSDS training on placards, but. Um, the only um, MSDS um, sheets that I had were ones that you had sent on um, Trimic. Yeah. And um, I was a little concerned because the placards are pretty serious. Um, you have the sensitivity placard, you have the corrosive placard, the flammable, and the toxic to fish placard. And um, so that sort of made me start thinking that um, we should have some kind of notification um, plan for your, our butters um, when you do spray so that they have an opportunity to take animals out of their yards or close their windows or whatever. Because, you know, over time, if they're exposed to the sensitivity, um, it, it, their reactions might get worse and worse. And um, so I was interested to have I know wind direction, and I'm appreciative of the fact that you're aware of the wind direction, but the wind can change. So I, I was hoping we could have some um, notification plan, like if you're going to do some spraying that day, um, maybe there are, on the abutting houses you could just um, put, because we, we as a town don't want to take any responsibility for this. So if you could just put hangers on the like doorknobs or something of people, like a 24-hour advance notice of that. Um, and maybe if the wind is anything beyond three to five miles an hour, you were not going to spray regardless of the direction, because wind direction can change. Um, I, you know, that was that kind of stuff. Not Not really onerous, but just have a buffer of some sort away from the property lines of, mm -hmm. of the abutting properties. Um, yeah, I, that, I will that say, kind James, of stuff. James, I think the question might be better addressed after Bob has con contributed okay. his piece uh, yeah, because I think it'll be. touch on some of this. Sure. I, but I just, we will come back. We I do just want to mention, we do have, um, you know, our research plots are located, generally speaking, uh, you know, within the boundaries of our property, uh, a decent right. amount of ways to provide some of that buffer. Right. Well, I, I guess I would feel more comfortable if we, you know, just talked about that buffer so that, you know, the neighborhood knew for sure that there was, a, you know, a guaranteed buffer of sorts. But I, I think that some kind of notification system that wasn't so onerous to you either. I mean, I understand that. But, you know, if you're the budding a property, I, I guess I would want myself, I would want some kind of notification. So just some kind of way to, to, to notify people ahead of time 
So they had the opportunity to close their doors. They could stay inside. They could bring their animals inside. You know, some some reasonable, mm -hmm. you know. I, th I think we understand your yeah. request. Um, and I think that um, our purpose here tonight was to share information. Um, we need to take your request back and really look at it. Oh, well, uh, that's why I was hoping we could talk about it now over the winter. So right. it was all sorted out, right. you know, by the time you started doing sure. stuff in the spring. But I would like to ask Bob to come up yeah. and share some information also. Why don't you take Thank this? you. Uh, thank you once again for the opportunity to speak with you uh, this evening. As uh, Joe pointed out, I'm the farm manager for the facility, so I have oversight of the facilities, of all the staff, to make sure that uh, everything that's happening there is being done properly and um, uh, to the requirements and regulations that, that they are mandated to meet. Um, so my colleagues and I, we very much appreciate the concerns raised regarding these potential impacts uh, of practices utilized at the turf facility. Um, we view the facility as a leading research center in the industry and therefore commit ourselves to environmental best practices. And we routinely present uh, findings that we have uh, to the industry as a whole. Um, because of the fact that many entities look at our facility for guidance, um, it's our goal to encourage best practices and make sure they're followed for the betterment of environmental stewardship, public health, and of course community relations. Um, so again, my position is to make sure that we are meeting reporting requirements and that everything is being done as it should be. Um, and I want to reassure you that that is the case at the turf facility and we are following all of the state regulations and protocols for the handling application of the products used in research. Uh, the facility is monitored by the Massachusetts Department of Agriculture or MDAR, um, as are all agricultural facilities within the state. Um, while the turf facility is a bit unique in that it's a teaching and research facility as opposed to a standard agricultural farm, um, we still have to adhere to those stringent application recording and reporting requirements. So the facility maintains records of all those applications and submits those records to MDAR annually for review. Um, those records include the date and time of application, the product, the applicator's name, their license number, etc. We also adhere to re-entry intervals. Our REI is listed on any product, so that's the amount of time you have to leave before you go into a certain area that's been sprayed at the facility. Um, that's for the safety of our staff, students, and faculty. Um, uh, we also, of course, follow the protocols taught during pesticide applicator licensing, some of those which James has outlined here this evening. Um, we do post a uh, notification within the facility for students, faculty, and staff. However, we do not currently post public notification as the facility isn't open to the general public except during planned field days and other events. Um, that's mostly for the safety of the research. You know, you can't have people going on a certain plot and then that could affect the research, things like that. Um, that being said, we are of course open to further discussing possible sharing of information moving forward to assuage some of the concerns that you brought this evening um, as we met here tonight. Um, I want to reiterate that while we are a member of the University of Massachusetts system, we're also a member of this community, your community. Um, we value the natural resources that we share and the relationships that we're able to develop. Um, we understand these practices utilize a facility may be concerning at times, but I can assure you that every aspect of the facility's research is performed with the utmost care, professionalism, and oversight. Um, we're committing to maintaining and improving relations within this community. And as such, I would like to invite the board and any concerned individuals to a public open house we're going to have this spring. Um, once we have a date set, I'll be sure to reach out to you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. I guess the other um, question I had or the other um, information I was interested in, we um, are just renewing our hazardous mitigation plan at this mm -hmm. point. Um, it expires next year, and we have no um, um, information as to any chemicals or pesticides that you're storing down in that facility and that is in a flood area and it is one of huge concern for us and we actually just had a tabletop exercise um, back in November um, and that area would be underwater in an event so 
um, one of the things we wanted to do was to make sure that we had a, you know, a real inventory of what you had mm -hmm. um, and that it kept, be kept current um, with our fire department and our um, emergency response team. Oh, sure. Uh, I think that's a very reasonable idea and a good idea. Um, I would add that um, the whole process is overseen by the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources and their Pesticide Bureau, and they are also available to answer questions about the materials. Mm -hmm. They also know what's there. They know what we're doing, and they're a third party um, if you want that. Um, we follow their protocols to the letter. That's, that's who we look to. Mm -hmm. um, and they're the experts. Um, and, you know, if their protocols change, what we do will change, both for notification and for application. So... Um, yeah, we generally have a list of f what farmers have that are in the floodplain. Mm -hmm. And this is something sure. that actually slipped under the radar. Mm -hmm. As I'm long sure as we you're here, we need, yeah. To, yeah. we need to add it into our uh -huh. um, inventory. Sense. I'm sure yeah. we can work with yeah. that. Okay. <clears throat> What I'd like to add to this is that the, the reason that we asked you here, and I'm glad that you, you came, mm. was more because we're acting as the Board of Health and that we got complaints from our residents that are in that vicinity. And I think that uh, although I don't have any sort of master's degree in any sort of chemical engineering, uh, I've been around this planet long enough. If I smell gasoline, the fumes are getting to my body. Um, and I also owned a large, own a large piece of land that I leased to a turf farmer for many years. And uh, I, I noticed that my wife and I would enjoy walks across a turf field, because even in the middle of summer, there were never mosquitoes there. Hmm. But also, we stopped renting the land because our yellow labs ended up with these bad burns on their feet from walking on this grass. Um, and I know that you probably have all the right to do what you're doing there. But once that air takes those molecules and moves them to the neighbors, those people are in some sort of harm's way. And I think notifying them or doing whatever else that you can do to prevent this is real important. Because although different manufacturers might say this is not going to cause this or not going to do that, we all know that chemicals have a weird way of you know, reacting to our bodies. And, you know, none of us would let our kids play on the grass while you're spraying this stuff. And you take protect, protective care, you know, so you don't get, you know, in contact with these uh, chemicals. From where your building is located on River Road to the south is probably eight, 900 feet away. So if you go to the north, within that same eight or 900 feet, you have 20 homes where there's kids, people hang close out, all of these things can pick up these chemicals that are drifting in the air. I don't know what the proper answer is, but I, you know, we need to start this dialogue to see if we can address this. So if the people are smelling this stuff, you know, 300 feet away, it's getting to them. And I don't know what the answer is, but we need to look at it. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess, like I said, uh, the first placard here on the MSDS sheet was is sensitivity, and that was what I was concerned about. Is that over a prolonged period of time, people, yeah. you know, tolerance for you know for the chemical is is going to be not good. So we we were concerned, and and that that was hopefully we could work something out. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure, yeah. Lynn. Uh, Oh, bud. Come okay, on. come on. I have a, a news correspondence um, from uh, Mr. Poli, and I don't think it made the newspaper, but it was in the news about the business there. And that's when we learned that UMass sprays 70 times a, a season. 70? Uh, <clears throat> well, I can comment that 70 is uh, a bit of a misrepresentation, because, uh, so for example, uh, we have researchers who are conducting um, very small plots that may be only this big for their uh, specific research that's going on. And they're using um, your same chemicals, James? Um, sometimes. But, or they uh, have their own chemicals? They, they may be using different varieties um, depending on what their research calls for. Um, so 
Uh, just to, to clarify, to say that we do 72 sprays doesn't mean we're, we're treating either blanket treating the entire place or even large areas 72 times a year. Um, that, so that constitutes uh, so a lot, lot of the of research. So the 70 or so sprayings, is it all the same material or is there numerous different materials that you're spraying? No, the, the, it's a variety. Uh, going back to what you were saying earlier with that particular compound, um, you know, that's a compound uh, I typically at this rate use about once every two or three years. Um, so the frequency at which I use it is rare. And many of the compounds that we use might only be used once a year or sometimes not even uh, well, every year. Well, because your schedule is from spring until the ground freezes, you have a schedule like, you know, March, April, May, all the way to December. And they said in here you had your last spring, but you didn't do it apparently. When your last big spring in November, December. Um, mentions that in her report here. Uh, typically, we have a spray that we uh, apply at the end of the year to protect against certain fungi. Um, I can't necessarily speak to that particular. So, did you um, do that and and spraying this year? Yes, we okay. were able to and apply what, that. And what month did you do that in? That was in November. Okay. Um, so, so I am one of the abutters, and and at numerous times throughout the year. We do catch a whiff of things, but we've been there 25 years, James. We never had a problem, and we don't want any problems. So once this was brought to our attention about the 70 springs, and then I have to think about for the last 25 years, I didn't know you were treating pests over there. I don't know what that means, pesticides. I thought they got rid of all that because of the peregrine falcons that live on the mountain there. So I'm, I was a little shocked about so Maureen and I have been there 25 years, so we were shocked about all this. I know you spray, I thought you were spraying like Roundup or something, but now we learn all this other stuff. So we are put back a little bit about it. We have reservations about the future with you spraying poisons there, but we're not going to inhibit you because we've been there 25 years and already we're there for 25 years. But this year in particular, 2018, it was the most wettest year we ever had talk to any farmers here, they were, couldn't even get their first cutting in. And you guys were spraying during the rain and whatever out there. And, it, and it didn't, I didn't question anything because we witnessed it for 25 years. So then we realized that all that's just running into the storm drains and running into the river. So is that really doing something when the ground is already saturated and you've got to use water to spray your stuff? I mean, uh, well, I do just want to um, point out that these, these applications are not made uh, in a, a manner that's not consistent with an appropriate use of them. So uh, when we make applications, um, that nothing should be or would be um, you know, accessing any storm drains or anything of that manner. Uh, any applications that are made are for the specific treatment of uh, whatever particular pest that we may be concerned about in terms of how it might affect the research that's happening there. Um, so, you know, as I said, the, the 72 is, uh, kind of speaks a lot more to individual things that may be happening related to the research. Um, but I can assure you that everything that we do there is, is done appropriately and in a manner that is consistent both with, um, you know, not to do, provide any undue harm to the environment or anything of that manner. May I, may I also comment on that? So, sorry. Thank you. Um, oftentimes, so if you see, uh, so if I need an application of a fertilizer, just for, for my area, I have sm some areas are small plots like, 1,000 square feet or 1,500 square feet. And so when he comes, and, and so a lot of these fertilizers that we use are, we actually call them spoon feeding because they're such low rates and they're taken up through the leaves. They're not meant to be like a, what you could potentially purchase at like a Home Depot or Lowe's where you're using a granular that's a little bit higher rate that would be going into, you know, and being released in the soil. And oftentimes, um, we might go out with some uh, granular fertilizers, and James could probably speak a little bit more to that, that um, are, again, they're, they're lower rates than what you would, could potentially purchase, but they're just gonna be released, and we put it down with the rain, because that way we don't have to irrigate. Um, 
but going back to this, so if I have him spray for my area, that counts as, as a spray. And so, I understand. Yeah, so yeah. I just, but I want to make sure other people also understand that because we have five or six researchers and I myself have about five different plot areas there that would be individual to me that I request for certain practices. And so, um, so I just want us to, to think about it also more broadly. It's not that we're doing 70 applications wall to wall. Um, but it's, it's interesting to know that you do 70 odd sprayings because we, like I say, lived there for 25 years and we never knew that. So it was, it was, it was a little shocking to us to, to know that and then to think that there's 70 individual sprayings of something that they weren't all the same thing. So we just, we just were a little put back by it, that's all. And um, so, uh, um, uh, hopefully there's no questions about solar. Um, I'm supposed to be funny. <laughs> um, uh, let me see here. Uh, uh, are you in the habit of giving your chemicals to the uh, butters? Chemicals? No. Okay. Or anything to do with what you're putting on the ground over there? No, the, so, you know, some of the abutters ask some advice. Occasionally I give that, but uh, no, I don't give any okay. chemicals. Thank you. <laughs> and let's just see here. Uh, uh, so you're going to give the names of the stuff you spray to the selectmen so we understand what you're spraying over there? Uh, yeah, so I have here uh, a list of the chemicals that were applied to this uh, most recent season. And for the most part, uh, generally speaking, um, you know, these would be, would, comp, uh, would comprise most of what would be used on any given year. Okay, and do you have a reciprocal relationship with the Department of Conservation and Recreation that owns the mountain? Um, I personally don't. I can't speak to the relationship that UMass has to. I'm not sure if I understand the question. No. There is, you have a fence, 10 foot fence that circumferences your property right. and you, and when it, the front along River Road fell apart, you shortened it down, which was really nice for everybody because now we could see when you have the experimental golf and all, we all are very interested yeah. in what goes on there. So don't get me wrong, sure. we're not a, 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 a against it. We just want to be more aware of what's happening right. in our community. Right. And just so you all know, where we live at, it's called Mountain View Estates. For all of you that don't know that, we're, we're, we're called Mountain View Estates. And so we're, we're very proud of that. And, and uh, the houses have come a long way since they were built. And so we pay a lot of taxes there. So we don't want to be uh, waylaid by something that we weren't aware of. Right. And so uh, that's about all I got. Thank you, bud. Thank you, bud. I'd, if I could just address one thing there. Sure. Which is, uh, you know, we need to acknowledge that we haven't been terribly proactive about communicating. It's our responsibility that we didn't do that, and we want to do that in the future. We, you know, Thank things you. like open houses, being here tonight, providing you with information, providing the neighbors with information, Great. is a good thing. And we're yes. very appreciative of that. Yeah, and just now like, we want to work together. I'd like to say a few things. I, I just, I can't thank you enough for coming. We, you know, we invited you obviously, but I'm, I'm, I'm glad you all decided to come and educate the public because I think a lot of this does have to come down to, um, as you just said, ed educating the people of what's going on. Bud's interested, other neighbors are interested. I've lived in the Valley for 47 years and um, I've seen that facility there for a very long time. So um, it's interesting to understand what you do and I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you're open to sharing the information with us and with the publics and then maybe we could talk about notification and just to rest, you know, make sure that residents are um, are understanding what's happening there, and how they can be safe, and um, and continue that relationship. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Oh, we have another yeah. question. Too. Thank you. Hi, my name is Hannah Yaffe. Um, I live at Five Beaver Drive, right next to Bud Driver. <laughs> so, I am one of the direct abutters of you. I mean, I don't even have. I mean, my fence, my property goes beyond my fence, and then there's a little strip of land, and then there's the road, and then there's you. <laughs> and so whatever you do affects me. And I bought that house a year and a half ago because of the land. I'm a, I'm a landscaper, I'm a gardener, it needs a lot of work. I've been out there for the last year and a half since I bought it, 
without any idea of what you were putting on the ground. And it really, when I read a TRIMAC safety data sheet and it says, don't wear your work clothes inside and you can be sensitive. I, I mean, I'm putting my hands in the dirt and planting stuff. I planted a vegetable garden and ate from it. My neighbors ate from it last year. Not too happy. My animals go outside. This affects me a lot, and I want to know. I want those safety data sheets. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, oh, well, if you feel like giving us the idea of what's going on, and I want to see the safety data sheets. I was an entomology major at UMass. I, you know, I understand the whole thing, the whole chemical, and there's a real discrepancy between what the chemical industry puts out as safety standards and what everyday people who work on the land, who believe in more organic practices. I mean, there's like a gulf of difference. So, you know, I understand I'm not going to turn you into organic farmers, but on the other hand, I don't want to be poisoned. I don't want my animals to be poisoned. Yep. And I think that's what we're working towards. I is, hope so. Yes. I, that's why, that's that's why, why we here. invited them. That's why we started this dialogue. And that's yeah. why we're doing this over the winter so everything can be sorted out. I'm also really concerned because having moved there a year and a half ago, I mean, I've lived in the valley for a long time, but having moved there a year and a half ago, the water table is incredibly high in that area. I mean, incredibly high. So whatever goes in, I mean, you know, I, I mean, my soil, it rains and I've got puddles. It's like, it's so high and I worry about all this stuff going into the water table, which is so high and going right into the Connecticut. And you might not think it's going, but I worry about the fish in the Connecticut and the other animals that live there. So I just want to register that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Yes. Hi. Yes, sir. Jim Shaper, 27 River Road, it's like the first house. Uh -huh. I'm just concerned about the fence. There's a nice fence when you drive down the road and you go up the way, but on the back side, animals and children can get into your you know, facilities. So that would be my question. When, the, when Tom Griffin ran it, he had the whole thing fenced in. So if that was going to be something that would be redone. Well, thank, thank you for sharing that. Thanks. That makes sense, too. Um, that would keep your test plots from um, being damaged at all. Uh, Rocky Foley, South Main Street. Um, are you guys aware that the right across the river in the last two years there's an eagle's nest right up and through there? Now, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there. You know, uh, I appreciate the practices you guys do about spreading, uh, taking care with uh, spreading the pesticides and that. But we all know what happened with the eagles population, you know, many years ago with the pesticides and that. Uh, just want to make sure you're aware of that. I did see that once actually on one of the islands. It caught me off guard. It was huge. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, sir. My name is Robert Maynard. I live at Six Beaver Drive. And all that we talked about here, everything is short term. What are the long? Does anyone in this room know what the long term of exposure is? Can anyone answer that? Has there any studies on this? Probably not. Well, um, the only MSDS sheet that we had was one that was sent um, uh, to the police station. And so um, having, we'll be able to study this and you'll be able to see um, what, I mean, the cap, all that stuff is on, would be online or we could do research. I um, was hoping to have the list of chemicals to do some of the research before they came, but um, obviously we're just getting it, but it looks like we're going to have continued conversation here. Well, so it's, it's important. The long term is important. But it's also important to know how, what, where they're spraying this stuff and how mm -hmm. they're doing it. And, and, I, and that's why I think notification is definitely, um, you know, a, a priority here. I'm not a stranger to overspray because when I moved down here 43 years ago, they crop dusted across the road like that. 
all that came right over into our thing. I, I mean, think most could, of us that were growing up. It burned up, your eyes. Mm. You know, I know. What do you think that was all about? Huh? I think most of us remember the days when yeah. we were out on the doorstep waving mm -hmm. to the DDT exactly. planes that went by. Yeah. So, I mean, I think, I think we'd be all sensitive to that, and we are definitely yeah. having conversation. This is not, um, we don't want to have bad relations here. We, we, you know, we're already putting out what we think would be reasonable. Um, and, and I look at this, if this was my neighborhood, this is the kind of stuff that I would want. And, and I, I think we can find common ground on this. Mm -hmm. and, and I certainly understand your concern. And that's why I, I, I'm appreciative of them bringing their, their sheets finally, and we can look at it. And um, the information will be public. It will be here at our office. Um, nobody's trying to hide anything, I don't think. No, but we're talking chemicals here. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's... It, well, I think most of us that grew up next to agricultural operations oh, yeah. or were part of agricultural, I mean, I grew up on a farm, mm -hmm. you know, what they do now and what they did a right. few years ago exactly. is not the same. Not a good, not a good thing. Right. No. And so we are, we are trying to be more proactive. Yeah. Um, that's one of the reasons I go to these classes and try to find out about these things, because mm. I think it is important that we protect the yeah, community. It's, so it's a lot. Because we all are members of our community. Yeah. So, right. but part of that is having a dialogue. Right, exactly. And making sure that we can work together. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Lynn? Sorry. <laughs> James, I guess one more question for you. <coughs> There's a utility easement that's, that runs beside my house that helps drain the whole estate there. And it, there's two pipes that run through your field. And one's like five and a half and one's six inch. But eventually, the bill, the, the, the build sheet for that development, they're supposed to be 30 inches in diameter because that drains the whole, east, the whole place. So I don't know when that ever is going to happen, if it ever is going to happen. But I need you to be aware that there's pipes running through your property for that easement. I think I actually, I think I know what you're talking about. Do you I, have I've a blueprint it. of that? Uh, we do have some, uh, there are, there is some missing information. But, Thank you. Um, I do believe I have seen that during real dry periods, at which point that starts to dry out and become noticeable. Uh, so it's on my radar. But I there's pipes. It's, so it's when you guys are digging out there, <laughs> just remember there's, so if you walk to the, the property line and look down to see where their cohort pipes are, you get an idea because it's got to flow downhill to that corner of it crosses your whole property so i don't know whatever is going to happen but i know if it ever gets plugged the whole place is going to yeah. flood so i'm just giving you guys a heads up about no, that i appreciate thank that you. thank you okay, thanks guys. lynn hi lynn lynn rose i live uh further up north i know i'm short but i'm not that short. <laughs> i live further up north, but I have a farm right on the river. Um, our water is very, sh our, uh, the water table is very high up against the mountain, uh, incredibly high. And I'm really careful what we do on our property because of the runoff into the river. So our concern, I think, is a town. There's a number of level. There's a number of things that I've articulated and I'll share, you know, with the select board. Um, let me just back up and say, I think Part of what's hard to stand here now is we don't have a sense of all the chemicals that you're talking about. I mean, you know, the, uh, the one that we did get in a little bit of time that we had to look at it, you know, you're talking about Trimec, which has 2,4-D in it. It's an endocrine disruptor. It's corrosive. You know, I don't know. We just got the SDS. I only had a little bit of time to look up the pesticide label. And for people who really want to know the impacts, uh, you know, you really look at the pesticide label has more information than the SDS although it's probably for the concentrate and not the dilution. I think what would really help all of us is to understand fate and transport in the environment. And for people in the audience, that means what happens when you actually use the chemical at the dilution um, that it's designed for, what it's fate and transport. Like if the, if the water table is really high, I mean, we know it's toxic to um, aquatic life, what kind of runoff are we getting? So we would like to know what your site conditions are. You know, where's your water table? Are there any public drinking water wells in the area? Um, where's the runoff going? Um, and, and what chemicals are you using? And, you know, the fan transport, like when I do 
you know, for my work, I, you know, I teach the right to know and all that. And one of the things I do for the people I work with is I make a chart of all the chemicals that they're using and we look at, you know, I lay out what all the hazards are, um, you know, what the precautions are. And so you have a big picture. And the sense I'm getting listening to you is like, so-and-so is using a little bit of this and so-and-so is using that. We, I don't know, I know you have the DAR records. I don't know if anybody steps back and says, you know, what's the big picture? What are all the chemicals that are in different parts of the property? We know that some pesticides build up in soils. We know heavy metals. Um, so I think we don't have the big picture right now, and maybe you do, but maybe so-and-so uses a little this and so-and-so uses a little that, and nobody has the big picture. I can't tell from what you're saying. So we would like a bigger picture so we really know the hazards are being presented you know, we're in a mixed-use area here, right? So you're abetting, abutting against residents, just like farms are. It's, you know, a similar issue. What I would let people in the audience know is that people who are pesticide applicators tend to um, have less impact on the lawns. It's, it's, it's the homeowners that are really polluting a lot of, you know, the, the grassland, you know, the lawns, because they put more, they don't know how to apply it. So I think everything you're saying about the due diligence that you're doing, I think is comforting, is comforting. I think, um, and, and so it makes us feel like, okay, you know what you're doing, you're doing it by law. Um, so I think that makes us feel comforted. On the other hand, we still don't have a big picture. And I think moving into looking at the hazard mitigation plan, the kind of information I would like to see, and with more time I could, you know, lay this out, but I'd like to know, you know, how you've got your chemicals stored, what you have for hazardous waste, Storage, I mean, this must overlap with DEP's hazardous waste regulations, I would imagine. You know, what do you have for secondary containment, for the floods, for just spills? What kind of spill response do you have? Um, so I would like to work with the town on the hazard mitigation piece, just looking at that so we know what, that we, what we're dealing with. Um, and I, with a little bit of time I had to research this, I come up with um, CMR, 333 13.06 for notification. I'm not sure it applies. It's for public and private lands that are non-residential for notification. And they talk about posting um, before. They don't give a time frame before, but posting before and then leaving it up 24 to um, no longer than 72 hours after. So I'd have to double check to make sure that that notification um, applies. I mean, it said public and and private non-residential, which I'm not sure what the university falls into. Um, it could be either. So I think I just want to, yeah, I think we'd like to know maybe as a neighborhood, we could look at mapping out the wells and, and, and maybe look at mapping out where the water is flowing and things like that and really get a sense of fate and transport in the environment there. And then maybe there's areas that, that, that you don't want to do an application because it's right where the drainage is. And I can tell you, I've been here for at least 25 years, and my farm, the rain, I mean, the erosion I saw in my fields this year was unbelievable. We couldn't even get a cover crop established because the rain just wiped it out. The erosion in my, my fields is unbelievable. It's down along the riverbank. It's just a huge pile of topsoil. So when I think of, you know, drift and I think of... Um, unintentional movement of those pesticides and you know pesticides build up with heavy metals and things like that there is movement here that goes beyond what we've seen in the past I mean we see wind erosion we see we see water erosion so we would really like to work with the university who has the technical expertise to really looking at mapping up this neighborhood and mapping up that land and really looking at what you're using in feet and transport so um, and, you know, is there, is there a way, I mean, I do toxic use reduction. Is there a way, do we have to be using 2,4-D? Do we have to be using an endocrine disruptor? Do we really need that level? I don't know if Mary Owens still, is she still at university? Yeah. Yes. I spent a lot of time with her trying to find less toxic chemicals for, for turf, because I work for cities. And, you know, th that is something I'd like to think the university is willing to look at. So. Um, well, I think, I think definitely taking in consideration climate change is one of the things that, you know, yeah. we're hoping to do. It's huge. I mean, yeah. what I've seen in my farm in the last 25 years, I've never seen anything like what I saw recently. Anyway. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Well, I think you folks got an idea of what we're looking for and stuff. Uh, we, we just want some information. Uh, 
Oh, I guess we have another. Hey, Mike. Mike Killeen, 112 Sunderland Road. James, do you have any kids? Uh, I do not. It's really not relevant. No. Uh, would you let one of your relatives hang in the parking lot really in that not. place while you were spraying? Uh, Mike, Mike, Mike oh, we're, okay. we're moving on to, we're trying to make sure we have resolution and um, common ground here. Um, so. Thank you. Um, next steps. Um, what would you like to do? Um, would you like to come back in a couple of weeks or a month or so, or what would you like to do? Because I, I think you have understand where, I think Lynn's idea of the big picture and um, you know having having us have a. Um, I'd like to beg a little time to answer that question. Okay. okay. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's what we're trying to do in the middle of winter here. Yeah. Great. And we'll get back to you with next steps. Okay. Great. Okay. Steps. Oh no, that's wonderful. It. And so, so is there any question what you um, knew, know that we're concerned about? It was a notification, buffer, um, you know, having an idea of the chemicals, and then from us as a town, you know, from the neighborhoods, you know, and, and maybe having a rather than wind direction, have have like a, a, a an agreed like wind. Um, three to five mile an hour wind kind of limit that there'd be nothing. So there's no question of drift, maybe. And then um, from us as a town, we are renewing our hazardous mitigation. We're in the process of renewing it. So we would really love to um, have discussions so we can add um, your um, uh, inventory of whatever you have down there and talk about secondary containment and what you would do in a flood. Cause, um, like I said, it was um, eye-opening to me to see the inundation maps um, at our tabletop drill. We're always concerned at the other end of town when the Deerfield River goes into the Connecticut, um, but the neighborhood, the, that Beaver Drive neighborhood, um, Ward Avenue, they, they really are at risk as well. Not, not um, as much as Sunderland on the other side, but still. There is some potential for risk, and so we want to add it into the hazardous mitigation plan. I don't think we'll have a problem. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I almost forgot one more thing, guys. Sure. Um, we don't have a sidewalk yet from Beaver Drive to the bridge, but we're going to. I just need you to know that. So people can walk, because there's been a problem there, because when the bicycle clubs come and use River Road as the bike path, and you got people with trails of children, with their, and they're going over to the park across the river, it doesn't leave much room, so I know eventually we're going to have to put in a sidewalk just for the safety of it. So I know there's utilities there and blah, blah, blah. So this could help us. You could help us, James. You got Thank some you. land there you could help. <laughs> Thank you. Um, anyway, so I really appreciate it. Thank you all for coming. Thank I really Thank appreciate it. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for everyone in the neighborhood that was interested to come as well. It's, it's really important to Very share helpful. your concerns. Uh, yep. Can you give us the oh, thank you. thank you. I really appreciate that. Great. Um, we'll make sure that um, we have a couple copies of that so people can see. And we'll get that to Dick. Thank you, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, let's go back up to the uh, DLT. The DLT A project. We were waiting for you. Oh. I, I asked them to wait till you got here. Do, I have, have, do you have what we, just so you, you know. went over yesterday? Yeah, I'd have to go. We went yeah. over all of these other things. You did, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to find that my DLA sheet. I may have to go just grab that out of the, uh, Your book? Your out of my office. Um, <laughs> okay. What? Yes. Okay, so let's see. So we were looking at, you know, different things we would utilize the FERCOG for, for the local technical assistance. Um, you know, just going through the, I don't know if you want to go this 
and yeah. see what your opinions are. Um, I really had, we didn't really have much on the first page. The second page, we were talking about uh, down towards the bottom, the older driver mobility and safety uh, campaign. And that, you know, Lisa White, uh, our nurse, is, is working with um, the uh, AARP grant. Yeah, we were or, just reviewing it today, did. actually. Yeah. Yeah. So we were thinking, how does that tie in? And, and so we wanted to kind of talk about that. Um, on the following page was uh, ensure a safe infrastructure to improve uh, visibility. I was thinking about, I think about, you know, the, the common yeah, and what yeah. we're working with there and crosswalks and lighting crosswalks and different ways we could look at that. So that was one idea. Um, How would the, that fit into the Complete Streets um, grant? Would I, that, um, is there enhance any? it. Yeah. <clears throat> would enhance it. I think so. I mean, yeah. gosh, that sounds really good to me. And there was um, I mean, I know now that Cumberland Farms has moved out of downtown, it's made it, all, you know, much There's less safer. kids walking there, yeah. but they're walking there and then no. And I know. Yep. So exactly. I, I still would really like and to see that happen. The thrift shop moving. Yeah. Yeah. This, that brings a whole other level of pedestrian. Yeah. Than, uh, and that's a tough spot to get to if you're one side or the other. Um, yeah. So uh, then the uh, uh, recreational marijuana assistance, we were, I was thinking, you know, still want to work um, for youth prevention. Um, there was, there's another section in here that would kind of hit on that a little bit stronger, which is. Um, on that marijuana um, public outreach, would that be working with CAT? Because I, I think. It, yeah, we, yeah that was on our list last year. We yeah, and we, yeah, never, took we never took of advantage of it. Yeah. So we need to do that. And I've, I spoke with CAT a couple of times. Um, on the back, like page five, it's support local substance abuse prevention policies for young people. So that may also kind of come into play. I guess I'd like to do that um, with, um, in conjunction with our resource officer. Mm -hmm. I would, yeah, that makes I'm, sense. I'm always concerned that there's not um, a more big picture. Mm -hmm. and, and, any, and that's our number one. We have to prioritize person. also. Yeah, yeah so we'll have to want. prioritize this okay. stuff. But these are things that Friday, I was thinking so. of. Uh, oh, I so, know, but the um, other the other thing that yeah. I was interested on, I know we skipped at five, but on four, back on four, was the um, regional. I, I would really like yeah, to make not, sure we I do a resource. Done, or, I wasn't done yet. Oh, no. yeah. oh okay. So just, um, and as we get to page four, um, you, you really need to prioritize this section as well. And we had a question, I had a, uh, just my opinions was facility management, municipal buildings and grounds. Um, this is kind of regionalization and how we work yep. with the schools in the town. My three would be the facilities, the human resource, and the sewer operators. Oh, I, well, and I had anaerobic digester was one of them because I, I know that's I thought that's already kind of, happening. Is well, that a regional thing that we're um, working I'm, with? Yeah, I'm going okay. to a meeting next week on that. Should I skip that then and just... Yeah, because we're, we're supposed to be... I thought we were, like, well, sort of involved with the Greenfield well, he, one. Well, Bob I'm, Dean has been attending those meetings, so we can just... I, I don't see there's any harm in checking it off because we are one of the involved communities that are looking at it, not just committed. Just looking. It's going to come I, back to you for discussion for really commitment. Like, you know, getting things out of sort here, but yeah. I read that uh, email yeah. and I was concerned because the way I took that is that Deerfield's involvement was a financial commitment to this versus just, you know, we're looking for... No, it's a first step in interest, I think. Okay. I mean, I, uh, I have no problem, you know, supporting it because no. I think we could... Uh, it could be more. From I'll, the thing. I'll but I don't want I would hate to see us make a financial yeah. commitment to this you, thing to support you will, it. Yeah, you, know? you will not yet. I'm going to go to that okay. meeting. I'm going to look at this stuff. I'm going to give it to okay. Diane, say goodbye. We and have to vote on it. <laughs> no. There can be no okay. financial commitment unless we okay. all three vote on it. All right. Well, that's that was my take. Yeah, and, and I, I have town okay. council looking at that intermunicipal agreement. Yes. Okay. So. <clears throat> so what, what were you thinking about sewage treatment and operation? Would we regionalize that? No. Um, well, remember we had we, we met Julia from Northfield, mm -hmm. and we were talking about um, um, sharing uh, operators and so, you know because the requirements are getting more and more for you know 24/7 operation, and sometimes I mean to me it would make sense to like at least regionalize with Sunderland and but, you know as um, staff wise. I'm just curious. Do you think? Um, I mean, the amount of work that our operator has right now to, to have him do, uh, 
another area? Or were you talking like we'd have contract. more money to do? So we'd have more than one operator. Yeah, well, I, I mean, to me, anytime you can share staff. Yeah, I just don't think cost. we would this, have the This would just taking cost. a look at it. You know, it's yeah. not committing to anything. It's no, no I just didn't know how right. it would work. It, it, well, it's one of those things I, like I, ambulance where you're, you're and, and required and to do stuff. And you have to have a certain level of yeah. staffing, but there is a finite number of people. I and think, so if you yeah. have right, but shared I, stuff. But, but, but running the overall facility is part of Keith's thing, but he also works doing a lot of the other stuff. So I think sharing him would, you know, would just open us up to, uh, right. you know, hiring another person. I think, where yeah. I think things, like you said, the, the facilities manager, things that are more general on a, on a bigger scope that people don't have to be at a particular location mm -hmm. for several hours a day. You know, they can look at uh, more things. Well, I, I, th I think this is also... Yeah. Um, so I just... Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I'm confused about the agenda. Sorry. I, I really am sorry to interrupt you, but have we completely finished with the thing there that says comments request about the mass, you know, from the planning board, the solar? No, they have yes. Oh, yes. we finished yes. with that. Yeah. Yes. We finished that. And have we you finished did? with set you bond? The you didn't do it at all. Conditions? No, we haven't. We you haven't didn't do the comments yet, Carolyn. Oh. I th no. Those are on the. Those. Yeah, done, Kip, you, Kip you, said that we weren't going to do comments because. Um, the planning board already approved the it. The planning no. board approved, right. the, the, but we didn't do the Deerfield Naturals, too. Right. Correct. We didn't do Deerfield Naturals. But we, we did, already, but we did the solar comments. We did the solar comments previous. Well, because the planning board already right. approved it, so know. we're yeah. not going to do it. But did you do, the next one says, <clears throat> I just wasn't clear, set bond amount and conditions yes. for the solar. We yes. did. We did. So we you're did done with the solar at the railroad? Yes. 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 Okay. We, you. We, I'm really we, sorry to we, well, no, practice. what we did is um, I wasn't yes. comfortable with the 1.5. Yeah, I remember that. So, we, that's it? We yes. agreed. We're done. We agreed We're done. We're done. We're done. Thank you yep. very much. I'm really thank sorry. You. Yeah. 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 No, 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 Ava, thank you. So, can I just say something about this sure. section? Yes. I think I was appreciative of Ava's comments, just to get clarity. Sometimes things are not clear because we do jump around. But on this section, it's really a way to find out where there's one or two or, two or more communities that might be interested. In in looking at these things. It's not, you're not held to it right. or anything. So if there's something you have no interest in, leave it blank. But if there's mm -hmm. something, hmm, I'd be curious to know. And if there's no other town, that's the end of it. But if there's a two or three, we might hear from them. So okay. I, I would take it in that so, spirit, in that light. So for the, for the first one, I, I mean, we, I think we can agree in this first section of the regional stuff, we could agree that the human resource management and facilities management for sure are the two priorities, yeah. And I yeah. would do anaerobic digester. Okay. Because they know whether to keep their efforts and then, involved in that project. And then the only other thing on page four was local official continuing education workshops, which I think are always a great idea. So you can, if they do workshops, then we can partake in those. I think it's hugely well, important because- it is, um, trying to get the people to go to them. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, Kip, yeah. <laughs> We've got to get you to go to more of them. Come on. Which ones? I've been to a lot of the planning ones. All right. Well, well, well we've got Board of Health and Finance Committee. And, no, I, I mean, I, I, think, I, I, think, um, the, I think the local I'm, education ones are really important. Can I just um, back you up for a second? Did you say this? I might have been a other engaged, but on the first page, mm -hmm. under housing, I have noted and I, I alerted the board weeks ago about our housing production plan is meeting its five-year uh, end, and that is something you could look at. Is that at. mandated at all? Um, there are new programs. If you notice Sunderland, I, what other community got some money from that housing infrastructure program? It was kind of causally related to housing. We, Kip and I talked about You had asked me about it. I said, well, it's got to be. And then they got a grant. It may be something to do with the senior housing that they're it, looking it was, at doing. It was related to their senior but, housing. But um, I think it couldn't hurt. You know, and again, you're not committed. It's just saying, it, to me, it's saying we recognize our plan is five years old and, you know, going to expire. But um, I guess I just, it's and then such a can, low priority for us because, in my mind, until the state um, funds education differently, we're not actually going to probably do much as well, a community. Well, it, it includes... Um, senior housing. I mean, it's not but just... We've been, that's been a priority for, since okay. I've worked on the 1999, and mm -hmm. you know what? Mm -hmm. The housing authority isn't doing enough with us. Uh, we could, we'll talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what you say. 
I mean, I get really crabby because there's just no movement on it. On? On senior housing. Okay. Senior housing is really important, and we just, there's nobody yeah. doing it. Okay, so, so you don't want to do that, you don't want to keep your housing plan up to date? And, okay. Well, that could be five, I guess. <laughs> I think, we should, I think we should just let's, keep let's, it on the list. Just let's keep just it keep it there. It, right now they're incentivizing happens. housing, but at some point they could start using more of the stick. So I think we should just have a plan, you know, available. I mean, I, I would, in case. I have no problem coming out and saying we want senior housing. Yeah. We've been saying that yeah. for 20-something so so years, and I don't know how many okay. hundreds of hours of meetings so I've gone to, right. and it's Good. been totally worthless. Excellent. And then as far as getting anything. Older Driver Mobility Safety Campaign is on I'm the list. I'm sorry I sound bitter, but yeah. I, I'm, I get discouraged. And okay. then, so are we, and when we do this, we're looking at, um, is regional a separate ranking? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so, yeah. yes. so then we had... Um, so really, we have the housing, we have older driver mobility safety campaign, we have ensure safe infrastructure through improved visibility, and then we have um, the marijuana or board of health yeah. kind Thank of you. stuff, yeah. and then we and then we have um, short-term rentals. I know that they, I know Furcock is, is definitely yeah, working on got, this. Yeah, we've got and we've council has given that. us a memo right. on this for the Airbnb. Yep. Uh, <clears throat> exactly. Taxes. Also, so. let me point out at the end of each of these is other. These are their Correct. ideas. Correct. And we actually have an idea. Um, All right. So, so what's your idea? You want to talk about it? In terms of which one are you referring to? Oh, we've doing an assessment of audit of, of operations to determine right. a direction to go with staffing in these two offices as we've looked at a planner, as right. we've looked at a system town administrator, mm -hmm. right. as we see transitions, transitions with myself <laughs> and that, and the, the inspections age and uh, office, um, you know, what forward direction. Now, FERCOG mm -hmm. wouldn't do the work. They would find a consultant who has expertise in sort of looking at operational uh, activities and um, staffing and what those needs would be, but it could help sort through how uh, Deerfield moves forward in, in addressing the staffing capacity. That's just part, part of the challenge that we're having and sort of determining needs when we're talking about the budget in these departments is that the staffing has been so transitional for, for several years now, so it's mm -hmm. hard to get a handle on you know, what we, what the true needs are at this mm -hmm. point. We're funding, um, you know, an, a, a pretty robust budget, but we're not getting that, those numbers of, uh, that, that service delivery at this exactly. time just because of staffing issues. So um, it's unfortunate to the constituents. And I don't need to, yeah. I don't want to reduce the funding. I want to, I right. need the staff. Right. right, no, no, you need it. You need the service delivery. So to we, maximize we need to, the use of the funds to right. deliver the service. Right. And having an outside person, you know, with no, skin in the game, you know, right. someone who's, who can really look at the operations and the services that, and, you know, um, I, I think that would be useful. It was actually Diana's idea. Especially because I think that, you know, over the next, like, three to five years, we're also talking a lot about promoting economic development and community development and a bunch of different kinds of projects. So, um, you know, those areas are going to be especially important. And you've been having dialogue for over a year about having some kind of planning assistance, but mm -hmm. really haven't reached consensus on, on what that should look like. One of the things that makes, I, I think that economic development is, is important, but it's tough in this town because there's no place to go. You know, there's just not a lot of available land to develop anywhere. Well, I think that that's part of it. I think you have to keep looking, you know, and developing different ideas. I mean, I'm thinking mostly downtown and infill development in the South Deerfield Center. I'm not really talking about big development like you've yeah. had, Kip, yeah. but but we have development approaching Deerfield. I mean, that's an yeah. example of what just happened. We have development coming and approaching Deerfield, and you know from being at the, seated at these tables that, that there's a lot of um, still uncertainty and some, uh, you know, there just, there just needs, we're oftentimes uh, looking for more certainty about the regulations and about, um, you know, the different aspects of it. So, you know, the planning board really needs support in that area, I feel, and that's what a big and part of what, you know, I've been doing, and I've only been doing one project for the time that I've been here. Oh, no. So, well, no, I mean, just for planning board. I mean, I've right. been doing seven other projects, but I mean, for the planning board, I've only been doing 
one response. You have yeah. two marijuana, you know, you have marijuana in front of you, you have solar right. in front of you. Right. Covestro um, is expanding. They want to do a, a TIF with the town. Right, exactly, um, yes. So Covestro, Covestro right. the Yankee Candle parent company. Um, yeah. So, so, so I, you know, that's... There's a lot of... Development that happens that isn't a brand new building necessary. Right. Although we've, right. we're going to have that, you've had that with the right. with the Oxford property. Right. You have you know Cumberland so Farms in the, in the center of town the right now. You know you have a lot of spaces that are that are um, available and are going to be you know they're they're consequential to your to your downtown. So you want to make sure that it you know somebody's you know and, talking and to those folks you know, and having we, dialogue. We ran out of liquor licenses because you had enough. Now we have one back, but there's. Right. In, as you said, infill, so. Um. I think it's a good idea. I think we need some help with the direction of that, so I would second, I would second that moving, movement. So that could be on the bottom. And the other thing that I think, um, they, they have regionalization of a IT network, but what more I'd be interested in is a regionalization of a, somebody that is really an expert in cybersecurity, because I don't, I don't think towns have the expertise to know if they're, you know, to stay current. Well, we're, well, we're going to go forward with having an IT manager probably with the folks we've been working with on this whole network, and that, but, that's what they do, you know, right. and that's I know, but part of their legit? I mean, yes. I, I feel like I <laughs> want somebody to, you know, help us decide what is the right stuff. Well, one of the so, things we're renewing our, our general insurance, as you know, we had a one-year free from Maya, they gave cybersecurity insurance. Well, my guess is they're also going to be doing trainings, and we'll have opportunities to participate in that and get credits and and all of that. Part of our whole grant with the e, with EOTS was putting in place policies that ensure cybersecurity as well, Carolyn. So that's part of the output of this grant that we're finishing up right now. I'm working I'm with so Northeast glad. IT. I, mean, I, I can't thank um, you guys enough. In in addition. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, in addition, we I did go to a meeting with the FERCOG. So we already are in discussions about municipal IT as they look at different options, whether it's I, uh, outsourced IT in a collaborative way or whether it's having an IT person. That would be a regional person that we'd have access to. Uh, those discussions are going on, and Deerfield is participating. So, But for now, we are uh, looking at having a contract for outsourced IT so we can Make sure that we stay on top of the IT needs and security for the town. Mm -hmm. Thank you, because I and I, and again, I can't thank you enough. That was really a ditch digging kind of grant, and then you got it changed to a much better, you know. We should check this off, networking. though. Let's check it off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, well, I just. Do do. I, yep. I think it. I think it can't. Because we are participating. Yes, yeah. 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 And I can't yep. see I've that it will hurt us at all. <laughs> oh, I was looking at. Do you have any other? Um, mm -hmm. No, that was just my oh, big yeah. thing. I so just the very last page was, um, I just had a couple of things, uh, you know, age and, and dementia-friendly region, um, regional opioid task force, which we're doing, um, you know, regional public health, um, um, work with boards on health interested in joining, you know, the district. I'm just curious about that. Um, support local substance abuse. I, I talked about that ori originally. So... Those are just kind of the ideas, you know, that, that I felt were. Do you want to? Well, all of them we on some That's level. everything. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, well, the, well, the, the, the other, time. the other thing is, I think I've asked you individually. Um, um, uh, Tom Hutchison, the town administrator in Conway, is very gung ho, and he's spoken with the other town administrators as well as um, the new school superintendent, officially Darius mm -hmm. Modesto, um, about sharing H, some kind of HR, and he's, uh, Tom is moving forward with um, a share, a community compact grant to look at opportunities for sharing uh, more professional expertise, how that comes out, whether it's a staff person or some consulting guidance or whatever. So that's going to come before you mm -hmm. soon, I think, um, to look at. No commitment of money, just a huge need. taking of money. <laughs> yeah, no, that's. A, I think that's a great yeah. grant. Mm -hmm. We're all in different places, pursue. and yeah. you know. Yep. Okay. And how the schools work with the with the towns, especially as it mm -hmm. relates to HR. Yes. 
So do you, do you want numbers on these right now, or do you need a consensus from us, or do, do you feel like you have a pretty I good kept, idea of where we're at? I just kept track of that. Good. So, I mean, okay. your, your last ones you kind of just said yeah. you had just prioritized already, so yeah. I just, okay. Yeah, I think you kind oh, of get We're, yeah, we're this pretty much doing, we're doing yeah, a lot is, of yeah. these things, too. Yep, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think there is consensus, so That's it's not really a big deal. Um, what's the next thing? Um, we have to go back to the comments, comments for Deerfield um, Naturals. Oh, that's why you're Deerfield here. Naturals. Okay. Do we have an update on where they're at? He's here. Oh, it's just comments for the planning board. Yeah, I'd still love to know while you're here. Do you want to have an update on where you're at in your process? We have no other attachment but the comments. Nothing better to do. That's <laughs> Uh, you want to come and give us an update of where you're at and where, what you're working on? Sure. I'd love that. Come on up to the table. I have, there, this is it. We don't have attachments. We simply have the comment form for that. Mm -hmm. yep. So things are moving forward for Matt, us. Matt, you have to tell, introduce yourself. Yes, Matt from Plotkin from representing for Deerfield Naturals. Um, so we are now scheduled to go to the planning board on the fourth. Uh, okay. So we have a site plan review and special permit application in. So those are both pending. All the documents have been submitted. The abutters mailing has been done, and the legal notification has been done. And that's for the the retail and dispensary and yeah. And so cultivation. it's retail cultivation and manufacturing. Perfect. Yes. Yep. Great. Sounds good. That's so your meeting when? The fourth. Uh, the fourth. The fourth. Of there. Okay. At six. I um, don't particularly have any um, comments. I, I hate to leave this blank. We need to say that we have no concerns or something. Um, but it's an existing operation. So um, switching over to the marijuana facility would probably increase traffic in that area. Oh, yes. Uh, quite a bit. <laughs> But based, no, based eventually, on, by the time they get a license. Well, we'll but see. But anyway, my, my thing would be that it's really just the volume of traffic would be the only thing that would really be of concern because they have an operation already. They already have access. They already have established right. buildings. I don't think that traffic's going to be that big of a deal. I mean, yeah, we all saw what happened in Northampton. But it has that was now the first. It's right. gone down quite a bit. And it's, you know, now there's, I think there's four facilities open That's four a, in Western Mass. And that was a very congested area oh, without yeah. the parking that they would have. It was horrible to go down to the DPH office for yeah. meetings yeah. initially when they opened up, but it's already dissipated. Yes. yes. So. so and now I don't, isn't there uh, another one uh, opening in East Hampton? Yes. And there's one, is there one opening in Amherst? Yep. Yes. There's one in for Amherst. Yes. So I, I, I wouldn't I, think it would I don't be think huge. That and I mean, we've seen that uh, the one in North Hampton is already hugely diminished from what yes, it was. Yes, it is. So. I, I can't believe the difference from when it first opened to. I, I know people who came week. from out of state just to be there on the first day. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, it was a, mo a novelty as much as oh, anything. Right. Yeah, well, so it, it was and gross. if you go back far enough, when it was Deerfield Plastics, there was an awful lot of traffic there. So I mean, and I'm, I'm you know I'm okay with the security plan, and I know the chief working with the chief on this stuff, yep. and they have, um, and they have a security team on staff. Yeah, so, so we could just say we have no opposition and we support the project. And that works for me. Um, I think it would be better to say that we have no concerns and we are supportive of the project or something. I thought, that's <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I thought you just said something. That's like, okay. I don't know. Try it a third way. Maybe I heard it wrong. I'm sorry. I apologize, Kip. I'll that's write okay. down what Carolyn said. And yeah, you write, you write down what Sounds Carolyn good. said. That's okay. That's I, 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 so you'll turn that. I, I don't, like I said, I, I don't think it's anything to do with No, I don't think so either. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Yep. Thank Good you, Matt. Thanks for coming. I'm sorry you had to yeah. wait. I'll put that in the Make a copy. So, we'll so, so, we've done, so we've done that. You've done a few. You appointed Melissa. We appointed Melissa. We did the liquor license. We did the class three license. Okay. We opened the warrant. We're not doing the other. We're not going to talk about the compensation plan until next year. No. Where are we still not? They tabled also, the, the, the just, board tabled it until we tabled it for they voted to table it till March, and we're going to proceed with the budgets with just the, the, way it was the explained, step right now. We always right do now. it back. I almost did it. We always <laughs> do it backwards, so we're going to continue to do it that way. 
Are we seriously not going to vote on that tonight? No, I, I, I don't feel ready to vote on it, Trevor. Seriously. Are you serious? I'm serious. I, I want to see the whole budget for a little while. I, I don't know why everyone's having a problem with it. Because this is we want we... you to vote on this and move it forward and yeah, set but... the budgets and get, get, get rolling. Well, I think there was consensus that we were all going to agree on the steps, right? Yes. So then let's work on the budget with the steps and then see where we're at. I, don't, I think that's, I mean, the wrong, that's what we usually, the wrong decision, but okay. But that seems like what we usually have always done. So I feel comfortable. Carolyn was saying that the, that, that the practice in the past has been to d make that decision after looking at the whole budget and seeing what the impact would be and where we're at. And I tried to make the point that you should have the dollar amount to create a, an, an mm -hmm. accurate budget. But it, yes. The impact is very small on a $14 million budget, but I would like to see what the 14 or $16 million budget is before we... Well, that's going to be $20,000 more or less. Right. I mean, and, like, what, and what the other, need to see? I think one of the issues, too, Carolyn, to, to consider is this special town meeting because, you know, if, if, and if this thing Great. goes through, that's going to impact the budget big time. Um, so, well, maybe not that huge because a lot of the right. going to be dead users, But it, it's going to be an impact. I mean, you know, our, our 2.5% is what, about $400,000? Be is it 250? 25%? 2.5% okay. of our annual budget. Oh, 2.5% of our annual budget? Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Oh. I think it's 450. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't know. So, you so that isn't, but, but you know, the, the, the right. sewer the plant sewer. thing definitely would be. No, you meant the levy. Yeah. Okay. That would be part of, that would be, yeah. Now, what we raise through taxation is 11 million, mm -hmm. 11 five or something like that. Yeah. I think. The schools are 70% of our budget. I'd like to see what the school budgets are wow, coming that's in. that's even less than I thought. So to, if our taxes go up to our two and a half maximum, that's only 287,000. So, you know, that the sewer, I don't have that sewer stuff with me. I was looking at but I think. The sewer, the sewer yeah. impact yeah. is like on a, on a non-user, it's like a hundred bucks. 120 bucks. I get no, yeah. For I understand. One shot deal. I, I understand that, but it's if you look at how much money that million dollars was going to be, I think that would add up. I think that added about fifty thousand dollars to it to the budget. Oh, and then and if every department goes up two and a half, that's where's that fifty thousand going to come from? You know, so. I'm, actually, I at the beginning of the budget ready. process, the chairman. So you're the actually agreeing with me, right? Fine, let's keep <laughs> going here. I, 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 I was going to say that at the beginning of the budget process, the chairman of the finance committee handed out a, um, a budget scenario that showed the, um, you know, that, that had a revenue projection and it sure. included what the growth in the budget should be. And it's about 2.8. So that's what most of the departments are, are um, you know, sort of, if, if anything, trying to live within. I think most, you know, most are looking at level funding or level service anyway, but I think that there has been this, this target anyway put out there by the Finance Committee. I think mostly to, uh, for the education departments, probably more than the town budgets, but... But when have they um, ever paid attention to <laughs> But just to at least have a, oh, no. a sort of a target that we'd all be be looking at, and, it, and an, uh, an end game, or a, a beginning game, I should say, with revenue projections, so. So that's what we've been, you know, looking at on the expense side. Right, right. But it, to, to my point is that. And that's about. And that's about. I'm sorry, Kip. I want to. I wanted to say it's about four hundred thousand on the levy. So it would be an additional. It was like three ninety eight, would be the total that we would be talking about if we raised, you know, with the revenues. That's what they were projecting. So we could raise an additional amount of the, almost. How much? I think it was about three ninety eight, three hundred ninety eight thousand total. So almost four hundred thousand right, in with, the levy. If that's with all the projections. So Correct. even that. Um, all right, let me change this. In. Three uh, times seventy percent. So the school portion uh, of that was two seventy eight. So it only leaves less than a hundred, or right around a hundred thousand dollars. So if you take that forty thousand for the sewer thing. That knocks it down to sixty thousand. So that's the money that you ballpark that you're going to have. 
Well, I think it's important to go through the process. That's fine with me. We'll go through the process. Let's go to the next one. Um, just about the town meeting special town meeting. I have two yeah. other things. Yeah. Um, I forget what one of them is. <laughs> I wrote it on my note. I could speak but to one of them the is um, money for uh, tie-in bond. We have that contract with them now to do some of the engineering that's being paid for by the MVP action grant. This would be to extend their contract to do um, more work in the Wapping Road area. Is that what's yeah. called? Not Wapping yeah, Road. Yeah, I, I have. It's like nineteen thousand dollars. I think is the cost of that contract. I'm reviewing that, and I, I, I feel like that's you know, I think that's a we'd, good price. We'd really like to ask for that on the special town meeting warrant because we are working on. Um, sort of the sister project of that, if you will, through the MVP grant, and to be able to use the information we're already getting through that grant from Time Bond and just expand on it to, to be able to apply for well, the hazard mitigation right. grant it's application. For a different grant. The, it would be you, a, a excellent. To right. If you look at the scope, um, they're they're actually doing part of the work already. So exactly. Right. Or, exactly. We're uh, building on work that's already. just a little bit more, and then the potential of getting the grant. And, and if we pass it at town meeting, then we have a potential, because um, the grant is due on April 4th. Exactly. So right. we have a potential of really accessing money for not very much upfront money, which is perfect. Exactly. Yep. And that would support our next, next step. For the MVP program, which would we give a, we would apply for implementation in the next round, and and set us up for that's some coming others. up very soon. Too. Yes, I don't know when the next round is, but we have to apply every single round because more and more communities are getting um, certified. Well, the other thing, though, and I brought this up in a meeting that we had weeks ago with Chris Curtis, who's been our consultant that we've been mostly covering through the grant, um, who's has deep knowledge of these of these issues, um, and you've met him as well. Um, the program is meant to do a lot of things. It's a it's a climate action program, um, and we do have in there updating the um, environmental or creating environmental bylaw, but also to update the flood um, zone zoning. Flood. And the as the floodplain maps are in process of being updated for the Connecticut and um, Deerfield River area in this region. Um, but if we just go in for culvert after culvert, they're not going to keep funding us for that. It's got to be more disseminated through the know. you know various projects. And he agreed with that. That was something I asked. Well, at the through. MMA conference, the governor recommitted more money to the MVP yep. program. So he's going to keep funding it. Yeah, in fact, he, he committed more money. He asking yeah. for tax money to do that. I know. <laughs> I said that. So um, I think I mean it's to our advantage to keep mm -hmm. hustling on this. Mm -hmm. So I would really this is and this is a very small investment to set us up for potentially large grants. So, yes, and and. We have to do something up in that neighborhood. That's a mess right. up there. You the, do one of your biggest septic systems are truly right. on the verge of. One family. of your biggest constituent concerns is water and flooding, yeah. and yeah. this would really help to yeah. alleviate yeah. that in a big, you know, an area that has a huge impact. Yeah. No, it's it's really it's bad. Well, I guess the next thing, is either one of you want to speak about your trip to yeah. Boston? Yeah. Sure. So I'll just kind of run down, you know, kind of what I did there. Um, did you have a good trip out? Yeah, we had a good trip out. Actually, yeah. we had a trip back. <laughs> 99 bottles of beer I know the what you're all the way. Yeah, great. no, but we had a good trip back. No, it was back. good traffic. We took two and we got in there, no problem at all. <laughs> and then we great. came back without any problem. It was just Before the snow, snow came, I know. it was Trevor perfect. Trevor dropped me off at my house. You went, Diana drove in yes. with them. I too. drove yes. in. Yep. Yes, I heard all yeah. about it. Yeah, well, <laughs> mostly all about it. <laughs> it was a good ride. Um, so, uh, you know, first started off Friday morning um, with, with an you know, opening session where the you know, governor speaks and, and all of that. Um, and then, you know, they break out afterwards. Well, the, the conference, the trade show opens up and you can speak to any department you want to of the state and then all kinds of vendors are there with all kinds of information. Um, but uh, in the afternoon, the, the um, workshops kind of break out. So I first went to Growing Pains, the municipal best practices for the marijuana industry. So a lot of questions and how that's evolving and changing. And um, that, that was a well-attended standing room only. And uh, everybody's 
kind of saying, you know, where they need to change, and they talked about looking at towns, host agreements, and, you know, there, there was a lot of discussion there, but it, it was a good, I think we're on the right path for all this stuff. We, you know, was there someone there from the there. Cannabis Control Commission? They had a table there. They had a table set up in the trade thing, mm -hmm. and then, yes, somebody was there. Yeah. And, uh, every week there's another story about them wanting to cut into the, I don't, I, criticize yeah. the host Everyone agreement. It's crazy Everyone when the state mad. gets, yeah. how much money do they get out of this whole deal and they're trying to hammer the state for one or two percent? I mean, give me a hammer break. The towns. Are the towns for that? Yeah. Just they a little backwards. With three samples? No, no okay. samples. I was just curious. Not, um, that, not that you know. <laughs> the next, next <laughs> session I went to were Listen. hot topics in municipal law and it really, um, <laughs> Listen. You're getting credit for this. We lowered I our enjoyed insurance it very costs much. I mean, because the, of all these I'm things. Not, Diana did too. Yes. I enjoy these yeah, things. I know, this is what I, I the whole reason I went. How um, much but, did you save us? I'm just curious. Uh, we'll we find we out. save a total of 15 percent on when for getting our Maya credits insurance? for yeah. over our general for insurance. Our general oh, liability. Yeah. 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 yeah, it is. It actually does come yeah, out to be a significant savings. Yeah, but it costs us more than that to go. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's very not. worthwhile to go. It's, it's what you learn when you're there. Yeah, I know, but working. it's built into the budget that we get discounts, so we actually have to make sure that we so get So a lot discounts. of the a lot of the topics in municipal law were, were cases that came or were adjudicated this year that were affecting, like you know, and they talked a lot about short term Personal. rentals, um, labor stuff, all That's kinds of different of things in there that were were being addressed. So that was a, that was a really good session. Um, you went to OPEB? Yeah, went to OPEB as well. Really? Yep, so I, I did that as, as Trevor well. Trevor was the one that went to He's going to teach that class next year. Soon. Soon. No, I want to say thank you, Trevor, because I was not going to one more OPEB yep, workshop. Yep, I'm fully, <laughs> fully trained in OPEB at the moment. Um, Saturday morning, we got up early, and uh, we had a Western Massachusetts Selectman Association kind of get-together. Nice. So during the breakfast, we kind of just hijacked a corner of the room, and we brought, uh, we invited everybody from Western Mass who was there, and we had people from um, Long Meadow and, um, and the Berkshires, and um, regional planning agencies were there, too, like uh, FERCOG was there, and also the Pioneer Valley planning and uh, so we w uh, what came out of that was a discussion of you know w what are we doing as selectmen associations and what are we doing like um, instead of having a, a meeting and a speaker every quarter are we really do doing what we need and looking at how we're reaching out and working together collaboratively collaboratively and we uh, decided to put together a spring conference where we would have a selectman association western mass kind I'll, of I'll organize get together. it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So uh, we're, we're putting that together. It's going to be you a, that you know, email, right? Yes, I oh, did. I've been oh, talking with Jonathan about it. Oh, and that's a great yeah, We're working idea. on a lot of that. So we're going to kind of pull that together. That's and awesome. then I met with Linda uh, Don Levy t th this afternoon at, at FERCOG to discuss, you know, how, oh. how FERCOG works with a selectman association. And we're trying to work, work that yep. stuff out. Um, and, and get that rolling. So that, that was really good. There was a lot of interest and people are looking to get together and kind of build on that and not have it be a top down. It's always been like, oh, the state, this is what this, we're doing at the state level. And we want to say, well, this is what we're doing at the selectmen's level and we want the state to kind of well, I think what, follow that. Just to explain a little bit is you, we ha had to have such senior legislative delegation mm -hmm. that they would come and they would tell us what was happening. Mm -hmm. So we're to kind of taking advantage of the fact that we have freshmen, um, women. senator and um, representative. And, women. and so women. now we're yes. going to be the ones to say, this is what we would like. Yeah. And, yeah, and, and they're 100% on board. It's they not are. like they're pushing back or no, anything. It's, it's, it's just exciting. we're changing the dynamics a little yep. bit. And then and the whole people wanted to be more proactive. Well, how many po politicians do you know that really do push back? They tell you what you want to hear. Well, we'll see. Right? You should know that. Um, moving on. Moving on. The Business and uh, Selectmen Association of Massachusetts kind of got together and had, the, had their time, elected their, their people. And then the learning labs in the afternoon. So I, I did um, 10 essential tips for a successful infrastructure project. I thought that would be... Good to Both of us did get that. A, that was yeah, good. we did that uh, to get an update on what was going on, and then I did OPEB, and um, and then uh, was a risk-based water and sewer rates. So it was talking about sewer rates and how to set that. You know how people are setting those and what the risks were mm -hmm. for not setting them. Um, you know correctly, and then we both uh, did that one. Can as we well. make a note for the next 
meeting, you decide when it is, whether it's next week or two weeks, to do sewer abatements. We've got to get yes. on. We've got yep. some. Okay. Put them on there, no, but that out. was that was why it was interesting to go mm -hmm. to the sewer thing. Yep. That and that's some good points. Did uh, road to funding? They talked about state works and mass works grants and complete street grants and that kind of thing. So it was a it was a good breakout on that. I did the OPEB. I said already, but and that was then <laughs> we had a closing <laughs> session, which was pretty good. And the speaker actually one of the speakers was the the first uh, opening session was the leader of Girl Scouts, and she talked about leadership, and she was an impressive woman and a uh, great message. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was really good. Yeah, that's awesome. So that was my that was my trip. Cool. It was good. Um, just to follow up on the um, Mass Selectmen's Association meeting, uh, the speaker, one of the speakers was the um, uh, Deputy Education um, Secretary. And so I, I actually followed up with him and, and explained to our situation about the zip codes and the, because it's very clear from governor's speech and different conversations that were going on and different workshops that the educational formula is going to be revised this year or this coming year. So um, we got to make sure that we're in, um, we fix our problems. And so I explained to him our problems and um, he said, go back to Sean Cronin at the DOR. So I did see Sean there and I will follow up with him, I guess, because I was very disappointed with the deputy. Yeah, well, as I said, I was on the phone conference today and they've accepted the report and the recommendations to change the formula that are not advantageous for, I know. for I, rural I, areas. I just, so. Somehow we've got to get the school, I mean, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be just us as a select board. The school, the school committees yeah. and the schools have got to get on board here. And, I don't know, maybe this is an opportunity to talk to Darius about that. Mm -hmm. a couple well, things that were, was there much discussion as far as the school choice? It seems like everything I hear on the news, I mean, the, our state government and the federal government's really pushing for the school choice. Does anybody they ever did. bring... No, they're not even talking about school choice because it's, it's only a rural issue, so that's not even on a conversation. Right. What the conversation was was on the charter, charter. schools, mm -hmm. and the charter schools are affecting the inner cities as well as us, but that is the conversation. No, there's not even any conversation about school choice, and they're not even going to address it. And and that's why I said I was very disappointed with the deputy uh, education Wilson. secretary because he was like yeah. cold fish. Yeah. They did say though on the call today that they are going to revise the reimbursement for charter um, right after we wrote our letter, and that was finally in the newspaper. <laughs> Good. But apparently they denied the Chinese immersion yes. school. Yes, they did. Um, but they, the letter. Th yeah, they took them what ten off. days. Yeah. It was in the finally in the newspaper. Yep. Um, it's just but kept, though, but they're gonna. It sounds like they're going to increase the the reimbursements for that. But that's the governor's proposal. But that's because the cities are having mm -hmm. you know really big effect. Um, I guess the other thing that I went to was. Um, the facilities management um, workshop, and Maya is paying for um, the Massachusetts Facilities Administration Association membership for all communities if they choose to join. So mm -hmm. I was going to have Kevin join because yep. it does give us resources, and they and they seem really legit, not just because they were referencing um, the book that my husband co-authored for APA. Um, as one of the reference books, but there was just a lot of stuff that was good information. It would be good resource for Kevin. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if it's worth us, you know, pursuing it. But it for Kev for free, why not? And mm -hmm. and Kevin can try it for a year and see what he could get out of it. Um, and um, there was a lot of recycle. I, I went to a recycling workshop, and I, I was good. really I was excited <laughs> about that workshop. There was all kinds of opportunities and. Things were happening, and I, I was because uh, this whole recycling thing is very depressing. Because, you know, in 2017, um, there was like $100 per unit of recycling. You're now getting $4, just to show you wow. the difference wow. in revenue stream because of what China's doing mostly, but also just a few other things added in. You know, there's a whole history we don't have to get into. The bottom line is what you were getting $100 for, you're getting four bucks for right now. So it's a huge impact overall. And um, 
but there, DEP has all these opportunities for us to do better recycling. Mm -hmm. And so, again, poor Kevin, I got to talk to him about that too. Well, Janet, like they have the meeting next week for the uh, grants, GEP grants for the year, and she's going to go report great. back to all the towns about awesome. that. So that's really great because I thought it was pretty exciting. And they had a lot of help, and they had a um, recycling kit, IQ kit, so you could sign up as a community and then you get all these freebie stuff, and I thought, you know, that, that could potentially be, you could get excited about that, because I got excited about it. And I'm not, like, the hugest recycle but person. But, I, you know, I think it's really important that it we is. have to make the next step, because what we're doing now is not sustainable from a revenue stream. We, we, and we destroy our right. environment. Well, it's from an environmental point of view, but our revenue stream is still based on that 100 bucks. Yes. And we have to adjust to that $4 situation. And so this is a way to do it. And that's why you know, we were talking about different things. Great but job. so anyways, I was pretty excited. But uh, are we still doing the executive session? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, is yes. there any public comment? Oh, I just, um, I had sl well, select board. More select board things. Okay. Just two things. Okay. Um, I saw Dorothy there too um, about the Dorothy. Mass Association of Conservation. It's no place like home. Uh, com yeah. Commission. Okay. She's the like executive Thank director. You. So I'm hoping we're going to have a couple people at least go to that March 2nd um, big conference okay. for the MACC. Okay, that conference. We, I yes. haven't gotten a notice about that. I did get the um, citizens I brought, I brought planner the training. The last time. Sent that out to the planning board and yeah, just zoning. it's uh, it's down at Worcester at the College of Holy Cross. Mm -hmm. It's March second, eight to four. Um, it's the biggest one. Yeah, whenever I get this, that, I send it right to. Okay, the, um, okay. and the other just I just wanted to pass on that um, Friday I found out um, that the Franklin Conservation District um, got awarded a forty-two thousand dollar grant, um, and that's the one we put in to do the popular popular river access areas that have accessibility and erosion issues. One of them is Stillwater, Sunburn mm -hmm. Beach, and then um, mm -hmm. the pumping station up yep. in Greenfield. So Excellent. we will be working on that. Um, apparently, one of the reasons it was a slow go on getting it approved was because DCR was not too excited about us having meetings about Stillwater. But in the end, they caved, and we got the money, and we're going to have some meetings, and hopefully Great. we can get some resolution. The, the idea is to have neighborhood conversations, what's happening, do an assessment of what's happening, what people foresee as would be their vision for the area, and then get DCR to participate and try to correct and, and so implement some kind of vision. So, so there's, there's a $42,000 grant for what? To hold these study? communities, no, to oh. hold these community meetings. Okay. Uh, the conservation district, we're, we have to, we're having a meeting on the 31st here. The conservation district is to um, figure out how we're going to set this up. Um, but what we're going to do is facilitate these community meetings. One will be here, or two at least, in Deerfield about Stillwater. And what you're doing is you're bringing all the stakeholders, like neighborhood, users, trying to figure out how, what are the problems, you identify the problems, and then what are the potential fixes for them, and then how do we get the landowner, which is DCR, to fix them. I don't, I guess I'm missing something. So what, what does the $42,000 pay for? It pays for the conservation district to um, have a facilitator to hold these meetings. So you, we're getting a, a uh, person. A, a person. We're going to pay somebody to come in and. Yeah. Well, we hire somebody. Okay. What we're doing is paying a facilitator. We actually have one in mind. Michael left up in, um, he works for the uh, Connecticut River Conservancy. And um, so we're going to talk to him about how we'd like to set this up. And he's probably going to be the one because he's very even How are we use $42,000 to build a staircase for people to walk down to the water on? Um, I assume it means holding the meetings, organize, publicize them, gather the information, put a report together, put grants together to... Potentially grants. Okay. And it's three sites and right. three communities. Although, it's, I don't know if you could do grants. It's not very much money, right. really. No, I know. That's why we got it, I'm sure, because it's pretty low ball. But yeah. if the idea is to do it. Yep. Well, that, I mean, we have so many complaints. Yes, that's okay. it. Okay.
Is there anyone for public comment? Michael. Oh, Either way. Have a seat. Sure. Mike Killeen, 112 Sunderland Road. I understand that the previous building inspector was not at work for quite a few days and he was paid for that. How does that happen? He was on paid administrative leave. No, he's not talking about him. Oh, can you talk? Be a little more specific. If Kyle like Scott. Him. What's that? He is talking about him. Oh, yeah. you are? Yes. Run that question by me one more time. Um, I'm under the understanding that he was paid for quite a few days that he was not working for the town. So I'm just curious how that he happens. Was paid, he was on uh, he was paid on administrative, administrative leave. leave, I think, until sometime in November. I want to say number six. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael's already requested that information, been provided yeah. the financials. Yes, yep. is that in the bylaws, how that happens? It's, it was a settlement agreement. It was a, is that public? I don't know that question. I don't a know the answer, I'm sorry. A settlement huh? agreement generally is public. Yeah. We can check with council, but generally yeah. settlement agreements are public once they're. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Welcome. Okay, at this time, I guess we're going to go into an executive session. Uh, general law, I need to read this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, so, so 30A, Section 21A2, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for uh, negotiations with non-union personnel or to conduct collective bargaining sessions or contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Uh, Second. Aye. Aye. Oh, okay. I vote aye. Carolyn Ness. Aye. Henry Camosa. Aye. Trevor McDaniel. Okay. Now, are we going to come back to open no. session? No. Okay. No. Our no. meeting no. will be adjourned at the conclusion of our executive sure. session.